Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. My uh, electricity went off momentarily, so I couldn't get, couldn't get on. Um, or my neighbor's doing construction or something happened. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. Welcome to the 11 a.m of the closed session of the September 28, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please, if you, let me look out to the participants here. Attendees, I'm not seeing any attendees in our meeting this afternoon, so we will go ahead and um, we will uh, move now to the roll call. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Uh, she informed here. me that she is going to, she's running a couple minutes late as well. Okay. I just got a text. If someone can let me know when she does join. Also, um, Kalantari Johnson. Present. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Holder is currently absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. Present. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on today's closed session agenda? I am not seeing any. Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned and the council will go into its closed session. We are ready to roll. Good afternoon, welcome to the 1215 session of the September 28th, 2021 Santa Cruz City Council meeting. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the screen of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council members Watkins. Here. Kalantari Johnson. Here. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Council member Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. I'm present. Thank you. We'll now move on to our presentations today. And first we have our Interim Fire Chief, Rob Odie, um, providing information on Fire Prevention Week. Welcome, Rob. I see that Rob's on, but I don't have his camera on and his uh, He's muted. There he is. There he is. Mm, that's me. I'm sharing it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably didn't think you were going to get there. Get to things so fast. <laughs> we're on time, at least for now, right? That's right. <laughs> Let's see. Do we, do we want to switch the order of the two presentations? We could, yes. I believe Bonnie Lipscomb. I think he's unmuted. I think he's unmuted now. Is he? Okay. Yep. Hello. Hi, Rob. Welcome. You guys can hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Um, 
Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, uh, Rob, just real quick, just I'm not sure if you intend, but uh, Bonnie, the way that we're seeing is it has, uh, we're seeing the, um, yeah, the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how are we now? She's not quite put it back up yet, Rob. Okay. Bonnie, are you putting it back up? I am. Is that better or no? Yeah. There we go. Yep, there you go. Awesome. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for, uh, you know, ha uh, allowing me to um, take part in Fire Prevention Week. Um, obviously, um, Fire Prevention Week is in October. Uh, next slide. Um, Couple things, obviously, the history of Fire Prevention Week, um, the theme of this year, and then, of course, as always, want to um, cover emergency preparedness. Next slide. Um, so, history of Fire Prevention Week, obviously, um, anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire of October 9th. Um, in 1925, President Calvin Coolidge declared Fire Prevention Week as a national observance um, and always wanted to include um, October 9th. Next slide. Um, yeah, like I, like I said before, observed annually on the week containing the week of the anniversary of the Chicago fire, uh, focus on fire safety awareness and all the messages uh, provided by the National Fire Protection Agency. Next slide. Um, so this week, this year um, is the uh, learn the sounds of fire safety. Next slide. So I wanted to educate everybody on the uh, different sounds that smoke and carbon dioxide uh, alarms make, um, knowing what to do when those uh, alarms sound, and then what happens if um, if they just if they're beep um, smoke alarms and and alert devices um, and then of course when when you actually have an uh, alert uh, what what do you do next slide so the sounds of fire safety are. Um, this one's next slide. Hmm. Uh, hey, Bonnie, can I go back to that last slide? There you go. Okay. I don't. Um, well, I don't have that 
slide in front of me, but if um, fine. Mm -hmm. You want me to move it forward? Uh, go So, um, again, the sounds of fire safety. Um, if you Uh, yeah, a single chirp. Uh, next slide. Um, so, emergency preparedness is uh, is a huge factor for us. So, so we want to make sure that we spread the message of emergency preparedness. And if you go to our website, you will. You, you'll see this flyer that I prepared. Next slide. And we want to message that everybody is uh, prepared for any emergency. Next slide. So, some things that you can do to make sure that you're prepared is create um, a, or join a firewise group, um, create or join a your response team, sign up for Code Red, um, develop an evacuation plan, and have a, uh, a communication plan with your family. and create a go bag. Next, next slide. For more information, you guys can go to the cdcnitudes.com and sign up for Code Red and also get additional information for emergency preparedness. Next slide. Any questions? Any questions from the council members on fire prevent? I think we're good, Rob. Thank you so much for the uh, for the presentation. Okay, next up, we will have a mayoral proclamation declaring September 13th through the 18th as Seawalls Week, and I will read the proclamation. Um, and then I believe, I will look for Bonnie Lipscomb, I believe we may have some visuals. Um, and are you, are you planning to put those up as, as I read this or are we gonna sort of look at that first? What's your, what's, uh, you and I did not get a chance, cool. Yeah, bon, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie is actually putting it up for us both. <laughs> Great, okay. So this is a mayor's proclamation, whereas the Pangea Seed Foundation is an international nonprofit organization based in Hawaii, acting at the intersection of cultural and environmentalism to further ocean conservation, whose mission is to empower individuals and communities to create meaningful change for the oceans through science, education, and artivism. 
otherwise known as CEA, and whereas Seawalls, Artists for Oceans is the Pangea Sea Seed Foundation's groundbreaking public art program that brings the oceans into the streets around the world by creating large scale artworks that speak to locally relevant, pressing marine environmental issues such as plastic pollution, ocean acidification, warm seas, local biodiversity loss, environmental justice, and more. And whereas the moder motto of the Seawalls Artists for Oceans program is a drop of paint can create an ocean of change. In fact, the canned paint for the Santa Cruz Festival was sourced from Smog Armor, a festival sponsor that produces unstocked, toxic, zero VOC-based, water-based paints infused with a mineral that attracts and neutralizes harmful air pollutants, including VOCs, airborne chemicals, and carbon, excuse me, carbon dioxide. And whereas the city's arts commission unanimously and enthusiastically recommended sponsorship of the Pangea Sea Foundation's Global Seawalls Artists for the Oceans program. And whereas the public works department provided logistical support, problem solving skills and parking garage walls to the Seawall Santa Cruz Festival and the economic development department provided financial planning and overall programming support. And whereas over the span of a week, more than 25 artists participated in creating 19 conservation themed murals in Santa Cruz. Many were local Santa Cruzans from within California and others were as, from as far away as Austria, Hawaii, and other states. And whereas the Seawalls murals are located at the gateway to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to bring attention to the global environmental issues that impact our ecosystem and to spark conversation and to unify and inspire local Santa Cruz, the local Santa Cruz community and our visitors to stand up for our coastal resources. And whereas the Pangea Sea Foundation Seawalls Artists for Oceans program is responsible for installing over 400 murals in 17 countries, and soon Santa Cruz will take its place on the interactive seawalls.org global map where, the, where with a, a click, one can explore each mural's unique story. And whereas the Seawall Santa Cruz video will document the festival for city residents and serve to attract more visitors to explore our murals and understand climate impacts on our region, downloadable city maps showing the locations and themes of each of the murals is available online, Seawall Santa Cruz map, and at locations around the city. And whereas Lookout's Wallace Bain has suggested that Santa Cruz may now rank among the elite showcase cities for murals on the West Coast. And whereas Santa Cruz city residents will get to enjoy and interact with these murals for years to come. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim September 13th through the 18th, 2021 as Seawall Santa Cruz Week in the city of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in acknowledging the many sponsors and community supporters of the Seawall Santa Cruz Festival, and particularly honoring local muralist Taylor Reinhold, Sadie Phillips, and the Made Fresh crew. And also um, uh, appreciation for the Tannery Arts Center for their organizing capacity as well the week prior and during the, the murals as they were being painted. Just want to congratulate um, this amazing effort in Santa Cruz, and we're so lucky and pleased that this happened here in our town. So thank you, everyone, that made it happen, and uh, everyone got to see the video. But uh, it's quite a quite a feat that we watched unfold here in Santa Cruz last week, and uh, we're very excited. I'll uh, see if any council members have any questions, and then we'll move on to uh, our next agenda item. And, and Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that Taylor Reinhold, who um, is our local sort of uh, celebrity muralist and uh, organizer through Pangea Seed for the Seawalls Festival, is available and here mm -hmm. today. Um, so he may want to say a few words. But I just also want to just add my appreciation. The timing of Seawall Santa Cruz, as we are recovering from the pandemic and what it has done in many of our areas has really been transformative. So particularly when you look downtown, the number of murals we have, look at the activation of Fraser Lewis Lane, it's just had such a very positive community impact. So I just wanna add my appreciation to all of you on the council for supporting um, Seawall Santa Cruz Festival and to Taylor and um, the Made Fresh crew for making this possible. So thank you and with that,
I'll check Welcome, it out. Taylor. Your uh, looks like you're. You could press star not I was a star six. There you are. Welcome, Taylor, and congratulations. Um, super excited you're here today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm I'm here with Trey Packard, the founder of Seawalls and Pangea Seeds. Uh, we're on site in Bimini, Bahamas for Seawalls Bimini. Um, just getting the wall today, and the artist arrived. So we'll be doing another activation here. We had to fly out the day after. We finished Seawall Santa Cruz, um, and we couldn't be more thrilled and excited um, on how the project worked out and just the community buzz that we've gotten and how many sponsors and, and people from, from the entire community came out to support us. So we're thrilled. Thank you so much. We're super excited. Um, Scott Greathouse, I think, is on here as well, um, and, and possibly Erica Rosendale, our local um, artist operations coordinators for Made Fresh Crew that did so much work to make the project happen. Um, and we'll be continuing the conversation. Um, Seawalls has never been back to the same place. Uh, they're no nonprofit, but because the event went so well, we're already talking about uh, Seawalls Santa Cruz 2022 or 23. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Trey. You guys, amazing work. Really, really appreciate everything you did. and. So glad you partnered with the city on that. Um, I'll go ahead and Vice Mayor Bruner has a couple of comments. I wanted to thank, um, good to see you, Taylor and Trey and Erica and Sadie and Joe and Fender and Griffin One, all the artists uh, that participated and really got to know Santa Cruz as they were here painting during the week. and. And um, we get to live with uh, the beauty of those murals every day. We're very fortunate. And thank you for bringing that ocean awareness and the beautifying those walls in, within our city. We really appreciate the project, appreciate your hard work, and totally are grateful. I'm grateful for the art that you brought. The public art is amazing. Thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to join from the Bahamas. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for the recognition. We greatly appreciate it. And Council Member Cummings? Yeah, I'll be brief, and, um, but I, I really do appreciate um, all the work that you all have done and the art that you were able to bring to our community. I mean, empty walls are, are just, you know, large canvases that need to be filled. and. Um, you know, the message that you all brought is this combination of environmentalism, but also inspiration for artists to see what they can do. And it just really reflects on how much our community appreciates art and also how much we appreciate the oceans and our environment and trying to inspire people to protect um, these ecosystems. So, you know, again, um, sharing with my colleagues how much we very much appreciate the community has, all, has been just ex overwhelmingly expressing how grateful they are for you all bringing this to our community. And so just thanks again. And if there's any way that we could continue to support you all in the future, because we know artists struggle to make these dreams happen, please let us know because we would love to partner in any way we can to help support you all in your mission um, so that we can just spread this message across the world. So thank you all. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Well, thanks you guys. Um, just wanna let you know that on a sister cities exchange last week, I did. I did uh, bring uh, the seawalls, uh, all your work you guys were doing in the city of Biarritz, France. You may be getting a phone call. <laughs> they have lots of big blank walls there, so and they're very much an ocean community, so trying to spread the word. So thank you again, you guys, and um, travel safe and keep up all the amazing work you're doing. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank Nana. you. Thank you so much. Okay. You Bye. too. Ciao. Okay, next, I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items Council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting 
are numbers nine through 17 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. I am not seeing any. We'll move on to, um, I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to our uh, agenda today. Fair enough. I'm gonna make a quick announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications occur immediately after item, agenda item 17, which we are estimating will be around 6.20 tonight. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 16, which again, we anticipate will be sometime around 6.20 this evening. I'd like to call on our city attorney to provide a report on closed session, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor Myers, member of the city council. Uh, this, meeting, uh, this morning, the council convened in closed session via Zoom to discuss the following items. Item one was a conference with legal counsel uh, regarding liability claims. Those are the claims of Mona Drada, Stephen Gil Nobles, and Zojaji, I apologize for the pronunciations. Um, those are also listed this afternoon on your open session agenda as item number 13. Council also conferred with legal counsel on two pending litigation items. Uh, number one was Nationwide Insurance Company of America versus the City of Santa Cruz et al. Uh, number two was Allstate Northbrook Indemnity Company uh, on behalf of Alexander Acosta v. Kyle Score et al. Those are two cases pending in the uh, Santa Cruz County Superior Court. There was no reportable action on uh, those items. Item three was a conference with legal counsel concerning initiation of potential litigation. Council met and conferred with the city attorney's office on that item. Continued that item uh, to the end of the open session agenda for further discussion. Uh, so that so the council will reconvene following the oral communications this afternoon or this evening to continue that um, discussion. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any council member questions or comments. Do any council members have any questions for Mr. Kandati? I am not seeing any questions. Uh, thank you, Tony. Okay, next, uh, the council will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any to the calendar. Um, we have no updates. And I will look at uh, interim city manager, Rosemary Menard. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think you might have skipped the city manager's report. Uh oh. You did, you're right, I did. Sorry, and I had a page. <laughs> Let's back up. Uh, we'll move on to item number six now. That is the uh, city manager report and I'll invite city manager Rosemary Menard to make that report. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor Bruner and members of the council. I do have a few items for you today. The first one is a uh, presentation and opportunity for you to ask a few questions on the eviction moratorium ending. At the, uh, which happens on the end of the day on Thursday. Stephanie Duck from the city attorney's office will give you that. And then we're gonna have a brief by uh, Lee Butler about the um, homelessness issues and followed by a quick update on Biketober uh, by um, some folks from our public works and transportation group So and a contractor. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie on the eviction moratorium. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and city council members. Um, I am here from the city attorney's office to provide just a brief update on the um, state's eviction moratorium, which expires this month on the 30th. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and I'm already getting air messages. So one second, please. Okay. I have it up too, Stephanie, if you. Do you mind, Bonnie? I'm getting a screen I've never seen before. There we go. Oh. 
Are you able to put it up, Bonnie? Sorry, yeah. I'm not seeing it yeah. yet. There we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Sorry. <laughs> um, so again, briefly wanted to cover, um, kind of give a brief overview of California's um, executive orders, the governor's executive orders, and the city's ordinances regarding both uh, commercial and residential eviction. Uh, the most recent state legislation regarding the eviction moratorium for residential eviction, um, as well as discuss a little bit about um, California's Housing is Key Rent Relief Initiative. Uh, before diving in, I did just want to make clear to any members of the public who may be listening right now that this presentation is meant as an update for City Council. Um, it should not be construed as legal advice for members of the public. Um, if you are um, in need of legal assistance, please contact um, an attorney for that assistance. Okay, now with that fun stuff, Bonnie, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so as all of you are aware, in March 2020, Governor, Governor Newsom uh, issued an executive order that um, essentially suspended any laws that would preempt a local government from enacting um, either a residential or commercial eviction moratorium um, as a result of non-payment of rent um, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. So in, in response to these executive orders, uh, City Council adopted an ordinance um, essentially a residential and commercial eviction moratorium for the uh, failure to pay rent, uh, when that failure to pay rent was a result of economic losses related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in August 2020, Newsom signed Assembly Bill 3088, which imposed a statewide temporary eviction moratorium for residential tenancies. Um, so with AB 3088, the city was uh, preempted from extending or modifying its uh, residential eviction moratorium. Next slide, please. So while the city was extending or further adopting any residential eviction protections, uh, Governor Newsom did issue Executive Order um, 8020, which extended the government's authority to impose restrictions on commercial eviction. Um, this was further extended um, until September 30th of this year, as in this week. Um, and so um, due to this executive order, the city adopted um, an emergency ordinance imposing a temporary eviction moratorium on commercial eviction. Um, the governor has not ex further extended that um, the local government's authority to um, impose restrictions on commercial evictions past that September 30th date. And so um, the city's commercial eviction moratorium will expire this week on September 30th. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, just real briefly, in addition to those um, executive orders and new state legislation regarding um, state and commercial eviction, uh, the governor also issued executive order number 4220, which prohibited water systems in California from discontinuing water services to residential customers or small businesses um, in infrastructure for non-payment of water bills through September 30th of this year. Um, that did not relieve water uh, customers from paying those bills for water services. Um, and then recently, Senate Bill 155 was uh, passed, which extended that prohibition until the end of this year, so de December 31st, 2021. Um, additionally, the State Water Resources Control Board has recently adopted draft guidelines um, to establish a process uh, to distribute COVID-19 relief funds um, for people who have those uh, debts for those water services. So side note on an, an additional protection out there. Next slide, please. Um, brief overview of the, the state's legislation regarding residential eviction moratoriums. Um, again, I mentioned we had AB 3088, which extended the resident, residential eviction moratorium to January 31st of this year. And then Senate Bill 91 further extended that through June 30th of this year. And Senate Bill 91 created the state's uh, rental assistance program, which provided um, rental relief to California households, um, so landlords and tenants who may be impacted by the pandemic. And that was initially meant um, the state would reimburse up to 80% of uh, rental debt. Um, 
Then again, we had additional legislation in the most current legislation. So AB 832 extended the state's residential eviction moratorium through September 30th of this year. So that's this week. And we have had no further legislation extending that. So the residential eviction moratorium, the state's residential eviction moratorium ends September 30th this week. Um, that bill expanded the state's residential, uh, the rental assistance program to provide for 100% um, of reimbursement for qualifying rental debt. Um, that legislation also expressly protects um, a local government from imposing any additional residential eviction protections until April 1st of next year, 2022. Next slide, please. Um, essentially, what AB 32 says is um, a tenant cannot be evicted for failing to pay rent um, as, a, as a result of COVID-19 uh, on or before September 30th, as long as they pay 25%, um, at least 25% of the demanded rent and deliver a declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress to their landlord. Um, beginning October 1st, so very soon, um, those protections no longer apply. Residential tenants may face eviction for their failure to pay rent. And beginning November, landlords may collect unpaid rent um, in small claims court. Next slide, please. Um, so essentially, this is the important part for anybody listening. Um, by September 30th of this year, um, any tenants who need rental assistance need to sign and, uh, sign and return the declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress. Um, within 15 days of when they receive it from their landlord. It should have been provided to them by their landlord. If not, it's available online. You can print it out there and provide it to your landlord. Um, apply for rental assistance. That is important um, by no September 30th, so this week, um, and pay 25% of demanded rent. Um, again, I just wanna make very clear to any members of the public who might be listening um, or any tenants or landlords out there, if you have questions on this, please reach out to an attorney um, for legal advice on this. Slide, please. Um, I've provided a um, non-exclusive list of legal resources for anybody who would like them. Uh, you can contact the Santa Cruz County Superior Court Self-Help Center, 831-786-7200, option four. Uh, the California Rural Legal Assistance, 831-724-2253. Uh, the Watsonville Law Center, 831-722-284. And the Senior Citizens Legal Services at 831-426-8824. And next slide, we will just briefly um, let everyone know how you can apply for rental assistance. You can apply at housingiskey.com. You can call 833-430-2122. You can text the word rent to 1211 or contact um, 833-687-0967, um, which will put you in touch with a local organization that can help you apply for rent relief. So that is the end of my slide presentation there. Um, we can leave that up so folks can see that if they want. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions that people might have on this. Thank you, Stephanie. Are there council members who have questions? I see council member Brown, council member Cummings. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for the overview. Um, I, I just want to note here, which is, uh, I imagine, obvious to all those watching and <laughs> listening, that uh, this is a very short timeline before the expiration of the moratorium, the state moratorium. Um, and so I just have a couple of questions. One is related to the rental assistance portion, and I'm not sure that this is for legal per se, but I'm. Um, we've also probably been hearing stories. I've certainly been contacted by people, and I know other council members have, and it's been in the paper. There is all this, um, you know, ostensibly there's rental assistance money and people aren't able to access it. And, and that's a very high percentage of the overall pot of funding, um, a very low percentage of people who have at least initiated the attempt to get rental assistance are, are running into troubles. So do you have any information about um, how the state is in that? I mean, you know, I, I just see this kind of gridlock potential here coming and 
Um, people are certainly very concerned and already receiving notices that they're going to be evicted. Um, so just wondering about that piece. And then, um, is, and I just wanna make sure that I'm clear here that what the new legislation says is that, that so we basically have to allow evictions to happen before we can, and just allow that to that wave to happen. Um, and then in April we can, of 22, we can reevaluate if, if, if we wanna try to put an eviction moratorium back on the books as an emergency, if there is an ongoing emergency, which I fully expect there will be. Um, is that what's happening? The state is asking us to stay, step out of the way or stay out of the way and that, allow us to continue. Okay. In not as many words, I would say, so the reason why the city was able to enact um, its first residential eviction moratorium was because the executive order granted the authority or, or essentially suspended any laws that would preempt the, the city from doing so. Um, the, the bill is very ex, um, explicit that we are, the city is preempted from creating any state or uh, residential eviction moratoriums until April of 2022. Um, I think that's something our office would need to look into further. It's, it's always been my understanding that we really preempted without that executive order giving the city the authority or, or suspending the laws that would preempt the city from doing that. Um, and that's certainly something our office can look into, um, but that is my understanding at this time um, that, that we would essentially, we would likely be preempted um, and that we certainly cannot um, enact anything until at least April, 2022. Um, and to, to answer the question too about, um, you know, I, I am not sure what the state is doing um, with um, if people are having issues um, applying for funding. I do know um, I did attend a presentation by some service providers, the Watsonville uh, Legal Center or Law Center and Community Bridges, and they did say that if you if you do contact um, some of those service providers, they do have a way to um, I think. Uh, contact the state to, to kind of give you a boost. So certainly something if you if there are tenants um, who are struggling with that, do reach out to those service providers out there and I think that they can help navigate that a little better. Thank you. And then, Does that answer? I hope that's... Yeah, I mean, it's... Not it's satisfying. Just, no, you're, I mean, you're with the information available, yes. I mean, it's just a, it's a very uh, dismaying set of circumstances that uh, I think we're fi gonna find ourselves in and you know the extent to which the capacity of the local organizations to have you know a lot of operators on call to be able to answer all you know the questions that are coming in on this deadline is um, you know is limited and um, so um, it's just yeah it's it's really unfortunate but I do think you know I'll just comment and say that I think it it really is an in incumbent upon us to find any and all um, avenues for supporting tenants who are in distress um, because it is, um, you know, it, 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 we're already seeing the impact and I think it's just gonna get bigger and, and more problematic. And um, we know when we keep people housed that, um, you know, everybody, everybody wins. So um, for sharing with us uh, your, your updates. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Cumming. I think um, my questions have mostly been answered. I was gonna ask about that kind of preemptive um, portion of the executive order, because I think it's important for people to know that, you know, that really has our hands and our ability to enact further protections um, as much as, you know, we would like to ensure that we can keep people in their home. I think it would be good um, if there's some way we can receive updates on um, whether it's the number of people who are applying to these programs, you know, in terms of rental assistance and and um, and also um, hoping that maybe we can get some information also about people who might not be receiving that assistance. I was contacted recently by a woman who um, I eventually was able to connect with the county and folks in Watsonville, um, and she had been issued a, a notice to quit, even though she had been paying her rent. Um, she had been having some uh, interactions with the landlord, but was issued a um, more or less an um, eviction notice, but it's not through the state. It's just a, what's called a notice to quit for members of the public who are watching. Um, but it was issued to her during a time the eviction went 
that people weren't actually legally able to evict um, people uh, during the pandemic. And when she tried to get assistance, one of the things they said was that there were thousands of people who were applying, but they're backlogged. And, you know, it takes three to six months to address some of these applications because of the sheer load of people who are applying for these for this assistance. So, you know, to the extent that we can understand how, how many people are applying, who's receiving, then, you know, really get to, get to know whether or not we're, people are going to be receiving the help we're, we're claiming that the state is providing or versus um, who's getting turned away. I think it'll be really important for us to know um, how we can not only get people the assistance, but improve these systems moving forward. So. And I can provide a link to council. I'm sorry I didn't include it in the PowerPoint. I know the um, Happening is Key website does have, um, a, a, it has statistics on, on um, who is receiving what is my understanding. And I'll send that to council. I see Bonnie is on here as well, if, if maybe she has additional information to provide on that. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. And uh, for Councilmember Brown and Cummings, if I can just, I'll just share my screen really quickly. I just wanted to show exactly the dashboard that Stephanie was referencing. And um, I want to make sure, can, is it showing on the screen? Okay, yeah. great. And so for the city of Santa Cruz, you can actually go to the Housing is Key um, website. And um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Jessica and Tiffany that sent this link over to me. Um, you can go and look up Santa Cruz County and see the data for the whole county, which is they've um, actually given in countywide, and you can then drill down on City of Santa Cruz, which is what I have shown right here, and you can see that 462 applications have been received. Of those, 461 were deemed complete. 151 households were served in Santa Cruz for a total so far of 1.65 million. Um, so that's between a quarter and a third of those that have applied have received on average, uh, looks like just under 11,000 in assistance. I don't know, and, and to your question, um, Council Member Cummings, what is the status of those that are still in the queue, what that timing is, and the reasons why they weren't awarded. Um, so we'll, we'll follow up on that and see if there's any further information we can share or any advocacy that we, that we can do. Um, Bonnie, I, Bonnie, can I just add one thing? I, the allocation to the county was $15 million from the original program in funding. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Yeah, between 15 and 16, I think. Yeah. And um, Bonnie, I'm wondering um, if there's a way maybe we could get some of Stephanie's deck, maybe our website um, and with, you know, Elizabeth, if you're on, maybe there's a way to, you know, make sure that it's very prominent since the deadline is, um, is Thursday. Um, to make sure that people kind of understand where they should go. I don't know if there's a way that we can make sure it's prominent on our website in case people are going there for help as well. And then I have one follow-up question. Is it, are there any other um, the PPP loans that went out to help small businesses, but are, are there any other forms of assistance for small businesses where we can point them to if they might be facing evictions as well? Um, Council Mayor Cummings, you're talking specific commercial. So we do have our expanded Grow Santa Cruz loan program, and we have a few million in funding available for Santa Cruz businesses through that loan program. We also have through our EE Trust Fund um, are considering a second round of micro uh, loan funds um, with our partner, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. So we did um, hand out over 51 um, loans totaling half a million um, earlier in the pandemic. And so we do have funding reserved for a potential second, second round. If we uh, look like we're getting close to exhausting, we have set aside for the Gross Santa Cruz Loan Fund. Thank you. Well, thank you. It sounds like, um, yeah, not a good situation at all. Um, anybody watching, please also know that you can contact the, you know, city manager's office for referrals to our, to our housing experts as needed. Um, we certainly, and we can provide Spanish, Spanish translation and contact to, through, um, Peter, our, our, uh, our, uh, our staff person. So anyone watching, please go ahead and reach out to the city. We'll help to the extent that we can. Okay, we will now move, uh, Rosemary, you've got, I have a couple, you've got Lee next. Yep. I, a couple of quick other things. Thank you, Stephanie. So um, 
deputy city manager and community development planning and unit community development director Lee Butler is going to give you a quick update on um, homelessness. Thank you, Rosemary, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm going to talk to you quickly about the Armory, the um, San Lorenzo River Vegetation Management, and a quick update on the uh, county's rehousing wave as well. So the city and county are in conversations of operations at the Armory, as well as how that would work with the city's operation of a safe sleeping program at the site. We're looking to see how we could have mutually beneficial and ideally coordinated city and county programming there. And we're in conversations with the county about how that could work. Um, we're expecting information with um, uh, information about that partnership in this coming month. So um, we'll keep you posted on that as it progresses. Um, with respect to the San Lorenzo River Vegetation Management, the council will recall this is something that's done on an annual basis. Each fall, we conduct significant vegetation removal activities along the San Lorenzo River to address flood control requirements. The vegetation removal work is starting this week. Um, phase one stretches from um, Highway 1 down to Water Street. And then um, the next two phases will continue south from there to the river mouth. Um, we are aware of people who are camping in that area. And um, those in the affected areas have been provided with notices and um, will continue to work with those uh, individuals over the next few weeks as the, the work is progressing in those um, next phases. And finally, um, uh, some information coming out of the, the county's rehousing wave. Um, we've talked with the council a number of times and the, the county was here and spoke to you as well with respect to their efforts with abode um, consultant um, as well as with housing matters as a consultant. And um, they are, um, this is a county contract that is focusing on primarily um, rehousing the individuals who have been in the um, COVID hotel shelters. And um, those hotels are closing down. Um, they're in the process of closing down, as you all know. So the, the update, that's all things that you, the, the update that I wanted to share was that um, the, the county has been, as of late, placing between six and 10 people per week um, into housing. Um, so that's, that's certainly an improvement over what we saw as the early numbers. Um, so we're pleased um, with that progress. Obviously we'd like to see more, but I did wanna share that um, that pace has been picking up and we're hopeful that it continues in the, the right direction and the same direction as um, more people are able to get housed coming out of those hotels. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Any questions from for Lee today? Let's see. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Lee. You're welcome. Okay, so rounding out the city manager's report today, we're going to have a, a little update on Biketober. So Claire, take it away. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members, Claire Globally, Transportation Planner, and I'm here today with Matt Miller. His screen is coming on right now from Ecology Action, one of our key partners in encouraging more people to try biking. And Matt is going to give you an overview of um, all the fun events happening in the month of October, which has been deemed Biketober, which the city is um, supporting and contributing to in order to continue meeting our Go Santa Cruz and Climate Action Plan goals. So Matt, take it away. Thank you, Claire. Hi, Mayor. Hi, Council. Appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for the time. and. Happy almost Biketober. I just want to confirm that my screen is visible to everybody. We can see it, Matt, yeah. Super. So this is uh, basically what I'd like to do just in a few minutes is just give you an overview of what Biketober is, define what it is, give you kind of an FYI, as well as invite you all to participate. Um, you may know that has been running Bike to Work Day for 35 years. Uh, and that is one of our big community activations across Santa Cruz County, where we inspire bike ridership 
uh, at all layers of society, from little kids going to school to folks going to work to people getting around for their basic transportation. In that spirit, uh, with our evolutions through COVID, moving a lot of our programming virtual and trying to find new ways of reaching people, uh, we have developed kind of a new way of rolling out Bike Month, which happens in May, and Biketober, which happens in October. And like all these campaigns, it's designed to get more people riding their bikes more often. So Biketober, which starts on Friday, has a few core components that I'd like to show you. What we're viewing right now is our landing page, which you can find at ecoact.org slash Biketober. And we have a few things going on throughout the month. It is, of course, anchored by our bike challenge. Uh, many of you have participated. The city of Santa Cruz has a big team. Uh, Claire, thanks for all of your championing of that uh, over the years. There's a number of you who are on the call today who have taken part. Bike Challenge is great because it allows people to do what they can to contribute. Uh, it's not one event on one morning, but rather if you get out for one bike ride over the course of October, that's a win. Uh, but it also enables people who ride regularly or all the time to have a place to come and support other folks getting on their bikes. So like many other challenges that we've done, uh, workplaces can sign up and they can have a team. Individuals can sign up and they can do their own goal setting and they can pursue prizes. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz already has a team in place. So anybody who is on the call that works for the city of Santa Cruz can take part in that. Uh, we have a series of prizes that are available, weekly prizes that give people gift cards to local bike shops of their choice to support them in their we have a $1,000 grand prize for one individual who rides sometime over the course of October. And then we also have a $1,500 workplace prize uh, for the top workplace. So we have a lot of financial incentives baked in, as well as all of the other methods that we have for supporting people. Uh, when people register, they indicate if they're a new or a regular rider, and then from that, they get customized messaging and resources depending on where they're at in their journey. To support biking throughout the month, we also have a few other things happening. Uh, you'll notice here we have a couple of workshops that will be taking place via Zoom. These are open to anybody, uh, anybody who has an internet connection. We have one at the beginning of the month focused on safety and rules of the road. And we have one towards the end of the month that's a deeper dive on bike commuting. And then throughout the month, we have group rides that are happening in different parts of Santa Cruz County, starting from Westside to Midtown, Midtown to SoCal, SoCal to Aptos, and also in Watsonville. And these are designed to be beginner-friendly, family-friendly rides that give people access uh, to low-stress bike routes, primarily for transportation uh, getting around town. We found from our own survey data, from all of these challenges and many years of bike to work, that one of the biggest barriers that we face in Santa Cruz County uh, to having more people ride their bikes, of course, is traffic safety and feeling like there are safe routes and safe places for them to ride. So these rides we started with in Bike Month, we are doing them again for Biketober and we're expanding them to uh, invite more people. So this is the, the makeup of Biketober. This is uh, the group ride page. You're also welcome, any of you listening today, we still have spots available. So if you'd like to attend one of these events, they're free. You get a free gift card to get breakfast or a destination. They are very fun uh, community-based rides happening throughout October. So you can participate or tell your people about it. And then the challenge part happens via Love to Ride. And that's where you can log your rides, join your team, set goals. Uh, this is a great place to send people to to sign up for the challenge. That's an overview of what we have happening for Biketober. There's a lot of great stuff in here. Um, behavior change is difficult. I would also just contextualize this for uh, city council and uh, many people who are probably stretched thin and have limited bandwidth. When we're trying to get people to change their behavior, it's really challenging. But Bike Month and Biketober offer really good focal points for people who are distracted and doing a lot of things to have uh, quite a bit of impact. So we have government, we have local businesses, we have 
community-based organizations and members of the public that all have eyes on Biketober. And so if we're going to invest our time at all in a given year, this is a great opportunity for us to collectively focus ourselves uh, to have a big impact. So I would leave you with try it, go for a ride, tell your coworkers, your friends, uh, your peers, your family, your kids. Um, this is a great opportunity and at least one of the tools in the toolkit to get more of our population riding by bike and uh, feel supported and celebrated for doing so. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Santa Cruz, for all of the really great progressive work you're doing to support biking. Claire, appreciate you uh, calling me in and I will answer any questions that might be coming up for people. Yes, there are any. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, mm -hmm. I will look to see if uh, council members have any questions. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, thanks for the encouragement. Last year was a little bit of a bust, but I'm going to try this time. <laughs> yeah, just start start small. Even getting out for one ride is great. Anything more than that is awesome too. Sounds good. Good to see you, Matt. Thank you yeah, for you coming too. today. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Anything else, Rosemary? Back to you. Okay get back on track here. Just for members of the public who may have joined later, um, we'll go ahead and go on to item seven, which we did visit previously. Um, I'll just make sure um, to ask the clerk if there's any updates to our calendar. There are not. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to item number eight on our agenda today. And this will be an opportunity for council members um, to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so the council and public can be informed. So go, I'll go ahead and work my way through council members here. Uh, I'll start with council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two, possibly three. <clears throat> I just report out on uh, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments at their um, September meeting. We had a presentation from the California Department of Housing and Community Development on the six cycle regional housing needs assessment process. Um, and that was followed by a second presentation by Heather Anderson, Director of Planning. Um, this was largely on the methodology options for the six cycle regional housing needs allocation us. Um, we didn't, we, we provided input, but we didn't take action at this meeting and received information. But one thing that AMBAG staff did um, express was that if any city wanted to have a presentation on the regional housing needs assessment allocation process, um, that they'd be more than willing to give a presentation and just knowing how that impacts, um, you know, affordability in the city in terms of our arena numbers. Um, if that's something that the council would be interested in having, uh, we could probably uh, coordinate something with AMBAC staff to have them give a presentation during our presentation portion of our city council meetings, to learn more about the, that process. Um, in addition to that, uh, from LAFCO, um, at the last meeting, we received a presentation regarding extraterritorial service agreements, uh, known as ESAs. These are meant, ESAs are meant to uh, be immediate remedies uh, for health and safety issues and are precursors to annexation, the annexation process where areas outside of a, a city's jurisdiction that receive services becomes incorporated into those cities. Um, at present, there are 41 active ESAs and the board recommendations send letters to the local agencies that are currently, they currently have extraterritorial service agreements in place and request that the affected agencies develop an annexation plan by March 31st, 2022. We'll provide a response explaining why annexation can't occur at this point in time. And then finally, um, just to kind of give a brief update, the um, UCSC City County Task Force has been meeting. And one of the big topics that we've been discussing right now is uh, the, um, the regents are gonna make a decision this week on and approve the, the final EIR from UCSC uh, that's associated with the long range development plan. And we've been really just kind of working together to understand um, 
how we're going to respond as a group and really try to encourage to understand um, kind of where the EIR is, um, where there might be deficiencies, and encouraging the community to speak out um, if they uh, are if they disagree with the university's approach around the EIR. Um, members of the council will be um, commenting, and I think we've had our task force uh, represent reaching out to other council members as well. And so um, I think tomorrow the regents will be meeting public comments at eight, and um, we're a number of us are listed to comment on the EIR, and um, it's a random selection process in terms of who gets to comment during public comment, but um, we're planning on being, uh, at least a number of us are gonna try to be available to uh, make comments at that time. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, council member. I'll move on to Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, let's see. Uh, Two by two committee, I think Director Butler touched on the last meeting that I attended um, really regarding city and county collaboration, looking at the Army and uh, operation operations options and uh, um, discussing the, the current FEMA COVID hotel funding, the shelters closing and the concurrent effort, the rehousing wave effort. Um, <clears throat> I was unable to attend the last meeting, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure on that update, uh, but that was the previous meeting. And um, visit Santa Cruz uh, board meeting, we're meeting tomorrow. Um, on the agenda, we have a rail trail presentation and also some activity reports for occupancy and um, ADR reports for July and August of this year. So uh, next update and I, uh, council member Watkins also sits on that. So maybe can add anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll go ahead and call on council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor Myers. I will report on uh, two commissions that I'm on. Um, Council Member Cummings gave an update on the UC City County Growth Task Force and the LRDB process with um, the UC Regents meeting. So I will start with um, the Area Agency on Aging. I um, attended the last meeting as a representative of the city of Santa Cruz. The, uh, quite a bit of the meeting was uh, talking about, again, the master plan on aging, the California master plan on aging, uh, which I've mentioned here before, um, but I just wanted to give, while we have, uh, just it feels like there's a sense of um, like a little bit extra time today to maybe go a little further into this because of our, our agendas. Um, you know, a little bit lighter. So um, I'll just say that so the master plan for aging, uh, along with that, there they've, the state has uh, designed a local playbook. And so our at the local level, we are as representatives of the various jurisdictions in the county, in Santa Cruz County and also San Benito counties, which is part of our area agency on aging uh, structure, uh, using the local playbook to um, help develop models, kind of um, build environments that promote an age-friendly and a disability-friendly California. Uh, we have, there's a lot of great work that's happening and so kind of inventorying that, but also looking at how we can work together to use the resources that are available to us through the state and then also thinking about the funding that will come through the mass aging um, to, to really be prepared for that. And so there's a, a set of plays and I won't go through them all, but um, a lot of it has to do with engagement with local leaders. And we are very fortunate that um, we have at the county level, and I wanna thank uh, the county staff and Supervisor McPherson's office for working on uh, getting some funding, some resources to help us work through the, um, you know, what, what we're gonna work on with related to the local playbook. So things related to goals around housing, um, health and, and other, and transportation equity 
for, and um, and certainly looking at um, senior isolation, uh, um, a major issue that has um, really become even more apparent during the, um, the shutdowns around COVID. So um, a lot of opportunity, a lot of really exciting stuff, and um, we're lucky, really lucky to have um, you know somebody who will or we will be. Um, but looking for somebody at the consultant level to come and help facilitate that conversation. And so look forward to hearing more about um, how local jurisdictions can work together to support moving forward in uh, a more integrated way around these in these issue areas. Um, the other meeting that I'll provide some highlights from was our um, September Regional Transportation Commission meeting. Uh, we talked about at that meeting, uh, the RTC authorized staff to update the Measure D five-year plan to allow um, for prioritization of some pre-construction activities that are really necessary to rehabilitate um, the capital of trestle. So five existing bridges um, that make up the trestle. And so findings from the, con the conceptual repurposing study that's been done um, concluded the conditions of the bridges are fair to poor, which is not great news, but it's probably something that most of us were pretty well aware of. Um, and so rehab is recommended. And, and so the county is moving forward as the uh, over, oversight uh, agency and will work with the RTC uh, moving forward on um, what it's gonna take to get those, those bridges um, up to par and um, potentially repurposed. Uh, we also talked about the um, kind of logistics and kind of issues around uh, preservation of the Santa Cruz branch rail line, which is um, the subject of much community conversation. Um, and so we just got a, a report on um, kind of what some of the intricacies and, and trying to better unpack uh, the, you know, what, what might happen uh, with the, uh, you know, what steps we need to take legally and then also policy-wise related to preservation of the rail line. So um, those are not for, for today. Um, oh, I will say um, that the um, TIG-M, a private company that is working on doing a demonstration uh, project here uh, it, and has been looking at the Santa Cruz branch rail and is a possible uh, place for um, some service. Uh, they're gonna be bringing a car or maybe, I'm not sure exactly the, all of the details, but um, they will be doing demonstration runs in South County and North County um, beginning October 16th. And I believe it's Coast Futura. It's um, the web site if you wanna go and get the details and the schedules. Um, is coastfutura.org, and you can find out more there and hopefully uh, take a ride. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thanks. Very cool. Um, I will call on Councilmember Contrary Johnson now. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'll report on the Metro Board and members. Please fill in anything that I may have missed. Um, uh, the biggest item that we talked about this last month was the outstanding balance of $6.7 million in pensions. Um, so the Metro Board approved a process to explore securing a bond, <clears throat> excuse me, that could save the Metro um, $36.9 million. So we're pursuing that. Um, we got an update about vaccines and um, vaccination requirements. So we've seen an increase in employee vaccination at the Metro from 75% last month in August to 83% this month. So that's really good news that um, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, and the Metro does still have um, this sort of hybrid directive, very similar to the county, um, that all unvaccinated employees uh, must submit to weekly testing. Um, and the Metro is exploring the San Francisco model, which is requiring vaccination of all employees. Um, we also talked about uh, structure bill, which would significantly impact um, all of us, but certainly the Metro board. Uh, so the house is considering a $1.2 trillion um, traditional infrastructure bill, as well as a 3.5 uh, 
um, trillion dollar human a human infrastructure bill that would cover child care, care affordable housing, um, medical leave. Um, yeah, th those are the big items. Actually, I don't think it's 3.5 trillion. I think it's 3.5 billion. Is that right, Mayor Myers? It might be trillion. Be trillion. Okay. I didn't. No, put billion. It Sorry, it is billion. You're it right. Is billion. It is yeah, billion. I thought I got that yeah. incorrect. Yeah. Um, so those were the big items in the Metro Board. The Community Programs Committee did meet, but I won't really, I won't report on that since it's an agenda item. So what we discussed is what's on the agenda. Um, and although this isn't a formal committee, myself and Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Bruner um, have been working on a racial equity resolution and, and have continued to meet with members of the Asian American Pacific Islander community and members of the Belpot community um, to look at specific actions we can take in the city and partnerships that we can have to fight against hate um, and address inequities and, and uplift our community. So those are my reports. Thank you, Council Member Contrary Johnson. Thank you. I will go now to Council Member Watkins. I was just looking at the list of, I think my colleagues have pretty much covered everything that I was gonna touch on. Like we had, um, like Council Member Kalantari Johnson just shared, we will have the core update um, this afternoon and um, what Vice Mayor Bruner shared in regards to visit Santa Cruz County. The only addition would be um, that they're still in the process of a search for a new executive director for that agency and we'll uh, share any updates as we learn more. And a number of my meetings are actually scheduled for the next couple of weeks. So I don't think I have anything additional to add at this point. Okay, thank you, council member. I've just got a couple of quick things. Um, I'll just um, follow up on some of the Metro um, items. Um, I did, I think there was some questions um, a few months ago in terms of uh, complete service uh, with regards to when UCSD comes back. Um, I did get some information from um, from Metro that um, all routes are going to be fully operational uh, starting now, uh, and especially routes 15 and 22, which were uh, suspended in the spring of 2020, those will be reactivated and fully, uh, fully operational um, now, uh, basically starting September 16th through December 8th. Um, Metro also is rolling out uh, the first four electric buses countywide who are dedicated to the Metro's new zero emission Watsonville circulator route. And then two will run on routes throughout Santa Cruz County. So this is the first of uh, 12 buses, I believe we have programmed that will, um, electric buses that will be uh, brought out and begin running routes. And then finally, um, for members of the community listening today, the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce and the Coalition for Clean Air and Metro have um, gone together and are going to be offering free fares countywide on fixed route and Paracruise service for clean, California Clean Air Day on October 6th. Get more information by visiting cleanairday.org and take the clean air pledge that day and get out and use um, trans transit so that um, your impact on the environment will be lessened that day. Uh, my other report outs will be on um, the city select committee, uh, which is a meeting of the four mayors and the county uh, with the county every quarter. Um, one topic of conversation, which some council members may have been contacted on um, recently in the last few months was the status of the senior center in Live Oak. We did get a report out that the um, school district is not planning to do the housing development at this point in time that was potentially going to um, move the senior center, off, senior center off of that site in Live Oak. So at this point, the school district is not um, pursuing that workforce uh, housing development as far as I understand. So that is still, um, uh, you know, apparently the senior center is going to be um, available for a while longer, um, which was not anticipated earlier this year. Uh, the last one I'll report out on is the um, 3CE, uh, Community Choice Energy, um, which now 
as folks know, stretches all the way to Santa Barbara and uh, San Luis Obispo counties. Uh, attended three, three meetings between August and mid-September. And uh, main uh, takeaways from those, uh, those were they did pass a, a temporary nine month um, rate structuring, rate, rate structure change um, uh, due to uh, increasing costs of electricity basically because of the um, Texas shutdown. So we did pass a nine month rate um, adjustment that will expire um, uh, in nine months. We adopted that and it would become operational in September. Uh, we had a um, we had an annual meeting on September 15th. And uh, I would encourage anyone that's interested in the work of 3CE to look at that. Um, there was some excellent um, presentations from both the CCA um, leadership in Sacramento in terms of lobbying uh, information there was also some very good uh, presentations on how 3CE anticipates actually being able to accomplish uh, its, its zero emission goals in um, really much more sooner, I think, than uh, most of us had uh, expected. And so some really good news on that was presented looking towards 2030 um, as a potential timeline where we could be close to zero emissions uh, in terms of per of electricity uh, provided through to uh, 3CE customers. And um, on, on uh, September 16th, the policy board met to adopt the uh, fiscal year 21-22 um, budget. And again, that was also a good meeting. Um, uh, there was quite a bit of requests from organizations and uh, individuals throughout the 3CE service area to increase the program's budget. And that was um, that was allocated in the um, in the uh, budget for this year, including um, a lot of the information, or excuse me, a lot of the programs that um, help with uh, purchasing EV vehicles, uh, doing, um, uh, providing more uh, charging stations, uh, um, zero emission school bus electrification, new construction elect electrification grant program, obviously education and community grants. Um, so a lot of uh, programmatic investment, um, the board and the policy board continues to press for even more investment in those types of programs. And we hope to continue that conversation into next year. Um, the one thing I will say is that um, Santa Cruz is often recognized, the city is often recognized as one of the first cities, if not the first city in the 3CE area that has a uh, building electrification ordinance in place. Um, we're all often pointed to, to, to as uh, a city that's done it and, and many of the jurisdictions are encouraged to follow our lead on that. So um, we get a bit of recommendation that way. And um, yeah, the annual meeting was really good. And I would again, uh, encourage anyone in the public who wants to track uh, the work of the Central Coast Community Energy um, to take a look at that for information in terms of um, outcomes from the last um, several years um, from, the, from the agency. Uh, and with that, I will finish my report and we will move on to our next item. Mayor Myers. Uh, Mayor Myers, can I ask a quick question about sure. PCE? Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, because I've been hearing kind of outside of the 3CE framework, uh, talking with people about the challenges that presented ongoing, I mean, this is an ongoing issue, the challenges presented at the state level for 3CEs. And so I'm just wondering if you, if there's anything new related to what's happening at that level, because it is a, very much a concern for folks involved in you know, solar energy production, people who are looking at um, distributed energy and storage and you know, how 3CEs are gonna kind of co navigate you know, what's happening in Sacramento. So if you have any update on that, it would be great. If not, next time. Yeah, we, um, we did receive a, 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 actually an extensive uh, report from the, um, from the, you know, basically the lobbyists that reference the CCAs throughout the, um, um, 
and um, they, you know, we are still positioning ourselves as a player. And you know, there's frankly, you know, a lot of the big, a lot of the big um, providers are seeing the CCAs, you know, as sort of a threat to their future. So um, many of the CCAs are getting out and getting uh, really competitive purchase agreements done with, you know, uh, clean energies and things that. So we're able to get, you know, we're, what she explained is that we're, we're, getting, we're getting into the game and getting into long-time uh, contract agreements, which, again, as the, the larger um, energy providers are, are kind of looking at the CCAs maybe as a place where, you know, they need to, to back us up a little bit. There was one CCA that did um, have to file for um, bankruptcy this year. We're not able to, um, with the, the different types of, uh, really with the spikes in energy costs, um, Council Member Brown over the last year, um, they were not able to basically meet, um, you know, their obligations and their purchasing agreements. And so they were, they did, they were their first CCA. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't remember offhand exactly which one it was, but they were able to, uh, they unfortunately had to, to uh, to basically file for bankruptcy, and you know their rate, their rate, and their customers are basically trying to kind of understand what how that plays out. Um, but you're right, the um, it's not all favorable, and there is a, a big push to try to kind of keep these. Um, I guess what I learned is a little bit more on a cottage industry type of scale rather than you know making a major dent um, in California energy. Uh, purchasing and production. So I think the next couple of years will be, um, and then also protecting C3, you know, CCAs from from bankruptcy productions and rate, uh, you know, rate rate changes and things like that. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of focus on that in terms of legislation for next year to try to keep CCAs as viable as possible. So. Um, I think uh, 3CE is definitely pointed to as a, you know, as an important 3C, uh, CCA that's been very successful. And so again, having some really good models out there has been helpful, but it's still um, a legislative push to keep CCAs viable. So hopefully that helps. There was a really good, um, uh, probably about a 25 minute uh, presentation from the lobbyist, um, which definitely worth looking at. Um, it was very, very well done. So not a lot of details there for you, but still still fighting the fight, unfortunately. Thank you, I appreciate it. Sounds like uh, we're hanging in there and we'll, more more to come, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and a lot of push from our own, you know, organizations and um, nonprofits around uh, in the, in the, just in the area that, you know, the 3CE area that continue also to wanna you know, as I said earlier, really want to make sure that the investments are coming in um, from the programmatic side as well. So not only just from the energy generation and purchasing, but also really working, you know, with people and families, you know, individually to, to really get them to wrap their heads around these. The one shift that I think we will move, be moving to and investing in in terms of some of the local companies is really the, the storage aspect of what needs to be done. So that's going to be a big push and that will hopefully help with some of our local businesses being able to have, you know, that or um, to to to, to uh, put the, that energy, uh, you know, those that energy use into storage systems that can be dispersed. So, um, and obviously with what's going on on in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley right now, Bruce McPherson's got his eyes on that very very clearly in terms of maybe a potential role for a 3CE. So, good work on that. Okay. Um, next up, we've got uh, agenda, our agenda, and these are items 9 through 14 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 9 through 14. Uh, there will be instructions on your screen, and please remember to mute your streaming device by pressing, and then press, excuse me, star 9 to raise your hand. Uh, you'll listen for the queue when I call your name and uh, you will be unmuted at that time. All items in the consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who want to pull, comment on or pull any items on our consent agenda today? Not seeing any hands. 
hands at this point. Okay. Um, I just have a question uh, on item 12. Um, I mostly just have a question and uh, I see Tiffany Lake is listed um, as a contact. So I'll give a minute to see if um, this is the Red Cross Housing Reconstruction Loan Payment Approval of Funding for Operation of the Nueva Vista Community Center and to assist residents of the City of Santa Cruz under the Emergency Rent Program. Um, Bonnie or um, Tiffany, are you here? Or Jessica's here? And Jessica, are you here? Yeah, yeah Jessica. I just, okay, I just have a quick question. I just wanna make sure um, for the public on this item, uh, that it's you know just known kind of the intent of this item which um and jessica correct me if i'm not right here but this is authorized authorizing eleven thousand dollars per year for three years um contract with the community action board um to assist uh renters in the beach flats area with emergency rental assistance and that will include um uh payment of i believe um I think first and last, but Jessica, I just wanted to see maybe if you could just clarify uh, the other part of this um, of this item is to support the Nueva with operation uh, operational funding of twenty five thousand per year for three years, which is amazing and great. I just wanted to make sure that if anyone in Beach Flats or in the community is looking for rental assistance, I just want to make sure that they understand that this is also available kind of post. Um, the, you know, sort of some of the, the state stuff that's going on. So this sounds like this will be a secured three-year program with 11,000 a year. Is that correct, Jess? Yeah, that's correct. And this is actually an existing contract. Um, it's just that it expired this year. So we're renewing it for another for three to four years, depending on how much money we have left over. So this money has been going annually to these programs and we're just trying to extend that further out. Okay, great, great. Well, that's good news. So thank you for bringing that forward. Okay, without um, any items being pulled today, I will um, go ahead and look for, um, first I'll uh, see if any members of the public would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda. Uh, we not, have not had any items pulled today. So if you are here to speak to any items on our consent agenda, go ahead and please star nine to raise your hand, your hand, excuse me. I am not seeing any members in the public that would like to uh, comment on the consent agenda today. So I will go ahead and look for a motion on the consent agenda, which are items number nine through 14 today. I see uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, I'd like to move to approve the items on the consent agenda. And Council Member Cummings? I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion by Council Member Kalantari Johnson, seconded by Council Member Cummings. Um, to approve items number nine through 14 on our consent agenda. Ask the clerk to please take a roll call vote. Um, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Member Golder is absent. Um, Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to item number 15, which is the core investments. Um, for members of the public, core investment stakeholder engagement and RFP framework recommendations. This is item number 15 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment 
and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to Ralph Demericut, um, the principal management analyst, our principal management analyst with city manager's office. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and um, uh, members of the city council. Uh, Ralph Demerica, uh, principal management analyst, and as Mayor Myers mentioned, for the city manager's office. And I am gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Um, I am here today to give you an update on uh, Camp Western. And um, I have 15 slides for you, including this one. Up on to the next one. Um, here's our agenda for uh, this presentation. Um, I'm gonna provide a quick review of uh, core funding, um, the process and timeline, uh, the stakeholder engagement process and participants, um, staff recommendations, and uh, what the next steps are. And um, I'm also joined by um, Director Morris, and um, this item was heard at the County Board of Supervisors um, this morning. Um, however, this presentation, my presentation at the back of material was put together before uh, this morning's uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, so if there are any updates or anything that you'd like to chime in, um, Director Morris, um, uh, please feel free to do so. I, I invite you to do so. Um, and uh, members may have some questions for either you or, or I at the end of this presentation as well. But um, thank you for being here today. Um, so a little bit of background on CORE. Um, as uh, many of you, as probably all of you know, um, in 2015, uh, the Board of Supervisors approved a phased-in approach to transition from the historical community programs funding model to a results-based um, collect model. And in doing so, directed HSD, uh, Human Services Department, to lead a design and implementation process. Um, and after extensive research and in collaboration with a wide variety of stakeholders, um, HSD, um, the HSD community program funding process was transformed into a new model, which is the core funding model that we know now. Um, the first RFP um, under this in 2017, and um, in that model, the county put in 4.1 million and um, had an additional $150,000 for set-aside awards. And um, the city, um, the city based funding was around $1.1 million. It's um, approximately a million dollars of $1,035,000 and um, with uh, an additional 45,000 in set aside awards annually. Um, and it was a three year term um, and it was extended twice through fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Um, so fast forwarding to today and where we are today with sort of um, today's um, cycle or um, presenting to you is um, really this timeline of how we've been preparing for the next RFP to go out. Um, what we will be discussing um, more thoroughly in my presentation is really this part, the uh, summer 2021 and fall uh, 2021 uh, sections. Um, but as um, you can see in this slide, planning started um, at, at, um, at the county, um, at the county level with HSD and their um, and uh, the coal and, and coal communications, and um, they throughout summer um, worked with different partners in the community um, to do a lot of um, outreach and really get community feedback on what um, a members of the community liked last um, last cycle and what we could improve on, and um, input they had was really putting together this framework that we're presenting to you today, and then um, we. Um, presented this um, sort of engagement process to the CTC um, group in June and as well. And then um, today we're presenting this framework to you and um, we'll be back in November uh, with the actual RFP. So zooming in a little bit more on that uh, summer and fall uh, window, um, the city over the summer um, was invited to a series of meetings that was hosted by the um, county HSD and and um, we met with funders and community partners to gather input on how to apply the core framework and operate operationalize equity in, in this process. Um, so uh, funders meetings were held and there were 29 participants um, from 
and 17 agencies. And um, we, uh, CPC, um, had an initial uh, meeting with HSC and um, their consultants, kind of what we're going to do is uh, talk about um, at these um, engagement meetings and all that. Um, further uh, community meetings were held. Um, ADA participants from 54 agencies gathered for these uh, meetings. And then um, a survey was put out, and um, we had 11 respondents from nine agencies. Um, we met with um, funders and partners as well, and um, and the consultants presented to the Human Service Commission um, in the fall, and um, we also went back to uh, CPC in the fall to kind of give an update on where these um, discussions landed. Uh, the purpose of these meetings um, was really to provide an opportunity to build a shared sense of the core, core framework and to deepen connection, communication, and opportunity for alignment for uh, collective impacts among funders and community partners. And um, additionally, those that attended um, the engagement sessions were offered an option to submit comments via a survey. And uh, a summary of the stakeholder engagement process was included in your back of material as attachment number two. And um, these meetings, funders and service providers were asked a lot of questions, but these were the two big questions that um, all of them were asked to uh, provide feedback on. One was, how can the core framework be used for making decisions about funding allocations? And the second, how can we enter, how can we center equity in the core funding process in concrete and actionable ways for both funders and service providers? And um, as you know, as just uh, mentioned in um, attachment two, um, there were varying ideas. These are really complicated questions, and there's a a lot of um, stakeholders involved in these discussions. So. Um, yeah, the, uh, the feedback we got varied. And um, however, there was appreciation for um, how complex this uh, answering these questions was and um, how complex to operationalize the uh, core framework into the procurement process. And um, with regard to equity, um, some of the key feedback included making um, equity part of the scoring criteria and to recognize that equity is an ongoing process and applicants shouldn't be penalized for learning how to um, work uh, on equity. Um, some common themes regarding the application included um, keeping the application simple and streamlined, um, having a different process for small versus large funding requests, and recognition that simplicity isn't always as easy as it seems and it still requires effort for both the funder and applicant. Uh, so based on review of the lessons learned from the evaluation of the last procurement, um, the uh, recent stakeholder engagement meeting and discussion with HSC um, staff, I, I am presenting uh, the following recommendations today for council to consider. Um, and again, um, today we're really just approving high, um, sort of high level, um, but we're, um, we'll, we're asking for direction to, uh, um, for how to move forward uh, with RFP process in November, just trying to get some um, approval for this framework so that we can come back to you um, in November with the actual RFP. Um, but the staff recommendations today are to um, approve core, the core invest contract term for another three years. And this would align us with um, the county's um, efforts as well. And um, the, uh, the three-year term was approved at this year's um, County Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, direct staff to return on uh, November 9 uh, with the core RFP and um, an update on the application process, um, technical assistance for applicants, uh, review panels and scoring, and some award funding decisions and process. Um, and lastly, which I'll get into more details about, is um, to consider uh, core investment allocation methods and funding options and provide direction and feedback. So there's funding options to consider, and then, um, then we'll go into allocation methods. Um, the recommendation or 
um, that staff is putting forward today. Um, first has to do with the set aside fund that um, the last five years, um, well, the, the first three years, um, we had $45,000 set aside um, annually and we invited organizations to apply for the set aside fund. Um, the recommendation is to roll the set aside funds over into the base fund and to um, not have that annual application process um, moving forward, but to actually just roll it into the, um, uh, the overall um, process this year. Um, and that includes creating a tiered approach for the funding award, um, having all medium and large buckets that organizations could apply for. And um, that way you kind of, you keep the spirit of those set aside, um, the smaller set aside uh, grant funds um, in, in, in the process with the small bucket over here. Um, and then um, this small, medium, large sort of separation of um, applications will tie into the um, allocation uh, recommendation that well, we'll get, I'll get into. Um, and um, the third funding option to consider is uh, to uh, determine the feasibility of increasing um, the city's base funding to join the county's efforts to fund a deeper separate investment. Um, this morning, uh, the county uh, board of supervisors did approve to increase their base funding by uh, $500,000. Um, so it, it's something that the council and um, you know, the city may consider doing is looking at our base funding to see if, um, if there is room to increase that or not. And then um, the allocation um, method options, and, and this is sort of the big question for today. Um, after the feedback we from the um, engagement meeting and all of that, um, we um, staff sat back and determined there are really three ways to move forward with how to allocate um, this funding in this RFP cycle. The first um, option was the target approach and that's to fund in a targeted manner, identify specific inequities to address. Um, in order to move the needle on targeted poor conditions, um, the benefit of this approach is that it increases the likelihood of impact and targeted conditions, and um, recognizing that there would be fewer programs that are funded with larger awards. Um, so city and HSC staff um, at, uh, today is not recommending this approach. Um, because well, we, we don't have sufficient data, the conditions to target. And uh, this approach would reduce funding for agencies and services not connected to the target poor condition. And um, staff does recognize that as part of the evolution of core, um, this could be a more viable option in the future. Um, option two, uh, uh, the broad approach is very similar to what we're doing um, now or what we did. Um, five years ago, and that's to fund broadly across all four conditions. And um, this approach mirrors how funds are currently allocated, and um, it acknowledges the interconnectedness of the core conditions. Um, the benefit of the broad approach is that it recognizes that all the four conditions have been identified as key aspects of the thriving community, and um, it supports many programs and services being offered. Um, implementation is that. Um, Distributing limited funding across many programs and services results in smaller awards and potentially less of an impact. Um, staff is not recommending this approach for this funding cycle um, as it does not provide the impact and vision for core. So option three, which is a hybrid approach, which um, did come up at one of the CPC meetings, I think the last CPC meeting, um, it was brought up and that's to fund um, a high, uh, it's primarily broad, um, but it would also include one deeper investment. And um, this option acknowledges both the need for a phase transition from um, funding safety net services broadly and um, the impact of deeper investments. Um, this approach requires that a portion of the funds available for award uh, be targeted toward uh, one larger investment. And um, as a consequence, um, we anticipate that fewer programs um, may be funded. So the funds for this deeper investment would be separate from the large grant size tier um, described earlier. So um, with this approach, there would actually be four tiers, um, the three tiers described earlier, and then this one jumbo grant. Um, 
currently um, well in my in my uh, back of material here I have currently HFD is recommending to the County Board of Supervisors that 500,000 of county funds be directed towards this option and that recommendation was approved this morning with the County Board of Supervisors and um, for this investment collective impact features will be built into the funding expectations and um, RFP criteria and in addition the proposal will be expected to explicitly address equity as both a process and an outcome. So um, option three, the hybrid approach is what staff is recommending right now. And um, that was the approach that was approved by uh, the County Board of Supervisors this morning. Okay, so here is sort of a closer look at that hybrid approach um, when you break it down a little bit more um, to see where the funding goes towards. Um, the, uh, we will, uh, with this approach, there will be three buckets, small, medium, and large, that will be funded um, in percentages that mirror historically how those um, buckets have been funded in the past. So we didn't have these specific buckets in the last round, but um, these percentages reflect um, the similar sort of distribution that occurred in the last round. Um, but then um, with option three, the hybrid approach, you, we add this positive impact um, line over here um, where it shows uh, the 750,000 going towards that fund. And um, this, so this, the county funds were approved this morning. And um, over here, it shows sort of how the city's million dollars and $1,035,000 um, will be allocated to the small, medium, and large funds. So our next step, um, we are planning to have another stakeholder engagement meeting in mid-October to get um, additional feedback on um, the application process, technical assistance for applicants, review panels, and scoring, award funding decisions, and all that, and to give our partners in the community an additional option to be involved in, in those decision-making um, efforts. And then uh, we'll be back on November 9th to um, present the RFP to the board and, and Santa Cruz City Council for approval and release. And um, proposals will be due early to mid-February. And then um, in May, um, we're, scheduled, we're scheduled to present award recommendations to the board and Santa Cruz City Council. So um, one more time, these are the staff recommendations um, that we are presenting to you today and is to approve core investment contract term of three years, um, direct the staff um, to, to return on November 9th um, with an update on the application process, technical assistance for applicants, review panels and scoring and the decisions process. And then um, some direction that we were looking to counsel to uh, today was, um, you know, does option three sound like a good approach? Um, is a tiered approach acceptable for, for council? Is that the right way to move forward? Um, is it, um, are you guys on board with rolling the set aside funds um, into the funding should, or should we keep those separated and should we continue to have an annual process for those? And um, do we, does the city want to look at the feasibility of joining the county and increasing our base funding? Um, those are sort of the major questions that are up in the end that, you know, um, we were looking for direction for today. Um, so that concludes my um, presentation and I'm available for may have. And uh, I believe Director um, Morris is still here too in case there are any questions for the county. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Randy, for being here today. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, um, I will look to see if there's any questions from council on this item at this time before taking it out to public comment. Um, I have a couple of quick questions, uh, if I don't, I don't see any of my colleagues have any at this point. Um, so one thing I noted, first of all, it's, you know, I compliment us and the county as our partner in this. Um, you know, and, and the increase that the county's proposing, you know, this is, I mean, this is about $6 million we're investing back into our community into these really critical services. So I wanna first off thank the county 
and thank you for your leadership in increasing um, the amount um, this year. As I, I think as we recover from COVID and all the other myriad of things that are going on, um, I really appreciate that investment and because what benefits um, folks in the county benefits are folks as well. So thank you, Randy, for your leadership on that. And um, it's an impressive amount of money between a small county and a small city to, you know, to provide to, um, to um, our community members. Um, I was wondering during all of the different uh, outreach that was done, um, during that time, do you, I'm just curious more than anything else, is there, are you also working, for example, with private foundations at the same time? And I'm thinking about the community foundation in particular. Is there a, is there sort of a leveraging kind of plan or not? Or I'm just curious about how their funds and support, do they, does that, is there any kind of match or leveraging types of um, work that's done, I guess is my question with the community foundation. Ralph, do you want me to cover that one? Yes, please. Um, well, first, it, in a surreal uh, uh, video environment, it's actually really nice to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to actually being in your literal house someday and seeing you in person. But, um, and also, you know, thank you to, to Ralph. Um, he got thrown into this process with no experience and almost as if we've been meeting every week for the last three months. Ralph, your presentation was walking step with ours this morning. Um, so, Mayor Myers, yes, we invited um, both Pajaro Valley Trust and Community Foundation to all of the meetings, and I was specifically approved by Susan True, the Community Foundation Director, to make a general in the board materials that were public um, and shared this morning, and I was approved by her as long as it was very clear there's been no final decisions which I did verbalize that uh, we have a meeting, we uh, county with community foundations specifically end of this week, because we see a mission alignment with um, what came up in our meetings from them as a funder with community providers expressing deep appreciation for their shift in how they fund small pockets of money, streamlined simplified applications and a deep focus on equity. So that was a piece of why we recommended this tiered approach in part so that we could um, implement what we heard was valued by the community and the community providers. So what this is, there's been conceptual agreement and Susan's point was, please make sure if you make a public comment, I haven't talked to my board, it's just a, a meeting. There's a conceptual agreement that it might be worth braiding funding from the community foundation with the county and city, if your board approved or your, your council approves this, to look at those small grants and have a partnership to expand those small grant dollar amounts um, and work with them. And we would come back to our board and to, through um, your staff to your council with that proposal on November 9th, if indeed this, these meetings lead to a commitment to investment and it would include in it how they would be part of the review process. So we are hopeful, but, but again, Susan it, it is conceptual and she needs to run it through the process, but that's, that's where we are with that, if that's uh, responsive. Thank you. No, that's exactly what I was hoping to hear. I mean, I think that um, all the work we've been doing on homelessness and raising, you know, public dollars um, to, to match. Um, and, and, you know, that's an area I, I think that's ripe for exploration, but I think also the Community Foundation did such an outstanding job with COVID and with um, fire response recovery. They're just becoming that private foundation partner, I hope, for the future. And so I think that leveraging is really great to hear you guys are talking. Um, it, I, I think the amount of money coming at from, from local government is very impressive. And I think, um, you, you know, donors appreciate those partnership approaches. So really excited that, that, that that's happening and hopefully we'll see more from you guys on that. That was really my question, main question on it. And um, if there's no other questions from council members on this, I will go ahead and uh, I just also want to recognize the community, um, the committee, uh, the council committee members who worked on this. Um, I know you guys put in a lot of time, so it looks really great. So thank you for doing that work. I will go ahead and take this out to the public at this time. This is uh, for item number 15 on our agenda today, which is the core investment stakeholder engagement and RF request for proposal framework recommendations. Um, and if you are interested in um, speaking to this item, 
If you could please press star nine to and when it is your time to speak, we'll unmute you. I am not seeing any hands raised today in the audience regarding this. So again, I'll bring it back to council for a motion. Um, and again, I just wanna thank uh, Randy and Ralph and the council members who worked on this and um, just amazing amount of, hopefully an investment that helps community programming throughout Santa Cruz County ahead of us here. Uh, I saw council member, um, I think you guys all raised your hands right at the right, right at the same time. So um, I'll go ahead and recognize council member Brown and then council member Walker. Uh, actually, I uh, was gonna go after council member Calendary Johnson and council member Watkins. Okay, uh, we could do that. They have the motion prepared. I just have a couple of comments. So okay, great. I appreciate thank it, you. but thank you. Yeah, I'll go okay, after thanks. That. Thanks, council member Brown. Uh, council member Calendary Johnson. Thank you. Um, I want to first thank um, Ralph and all of your work on this. I know you've worked super hard over the um, on this on this program, and I want to thank Randy and um, your team and everyone at the county, um, as Mayor Meyer said, on your leadership. Um, it's it's really wonderful to be on this side of it as a grant writer. Um, I've written grant proposals for the core funding, so um, to to help um, guide the decision making process and invest in our community in this way is, is really meaningful. Um, I really want to acknowledge our service providers. Um, they are always there to serve those who are most in need. Um, and certainly they've been there and then some over the last year and a half. Um, they invest tremendously in our community. And I'm, I'm so glad that our city and our community, our county, um, take this opportunity to invest back in them. Um, so I think those are just the comments I wanted to make. This is just, this is, such a fun part of being a council member. Um, I'm so thrilled that we are hopefully going to be making this investment. Um, and with that, I um, I did work with council members Watkins and Brown, my colleagues on the community programs committee to put forward a motion. And if Bonnie, um, if you wouldn't mind putting that up. Um, so the motion is to approve the recommendation of the core investment term of three years. Um, pursue core investment allocation method option three, which is the hybrid approach that is primarily broad, but would also include one deeper investment. Um, I did wanna add here that we wanna ensure that the deeper investment is also serving community members who reside in the city of San Francisco. Um, motion to fold the, our 45,000 set aside allocations into core investment based funding and use this set aside as a means of increasing our base funding. Um, and then fourth item here is to direct staff to return on November 9th, 2021 with core RFP and an update on the applicant technical assistance for application applicants, review panels and scoring and award funding decisions process. So that's the motion put forward. Um, I would also like to just um, ask that um, we do explore what increasing our base funding to 10% um, would look like and, and come back and have that on November 9th. And that doesn't need to be part of the motion language, but I would like us to um, explore that for the next time we come together on this. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Watkins. Um, I'll go ahead and second the motion, and then if maybe I could just make a few comments right now, Mayor. Sure. Okay, great. Um, I too just want to thank my colleague, Council Member Brown and Council Member Calentari Johnson, for all the thought and um, effort put into this colleagues, um, Ralph and Randy at the county and the Nicole who aren't here with us today. Um, this wasn't always an easy process. I will just say it was really challenging to switch from a really um, known sort of in the community model to a new way of, of doing funding allocations. And I was really encouraged to hear that the community foundation is interested in partnering with us. That is um, truly collective impact in a way that I think we wanna see it. Uh, play out in regards to really moving the needle on some of these really big social issues we're trying to address. So that is really encouraging and I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us today, Randy, and for being here. Um, and, and just in general, just wanna acknowledge how important as Councilmember Calentari Johnson brought up, having our safety net providers supported um, in a 
going to, to meet the needs of the community in ways that we cannot. And um, really want to thank the thought that went into the evolution of this process, essentially moving from sort of a one size fits all to really thinking about it as a tiered approach, really um, embracing equity in that way. And, um, and I, I feel, although I know it's not perfect, it's definitely been uh, very responsive to community needs, to, to, to um, program needs and provider needs, and is a, is a continuous um, kind of improvement process that I think we can be really proud of. So I'm, I'm happy to go in this direction and um, happy to second the motion and, and just my appreciation to everybody who was involved in getting us to this point. Thank you, council member. Council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. So I'll echo all of those comments, um, expressing my appreciation for the staff at the city and county who have been involved in this, our, our consultants who have been working on this, kind of carrying, uh, you know, navigating us through this over the five-year period. And, um, you know, just just really applaud the all of that work. And um, also uh, thanks to my uh, Community Programs Committee colleagues, um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and Watkins. I, you know, this, it, as Council Member Watkins suggests, this has not been easy. Um, there are, there continue to be challenges. And, you know, we hear from uh, the service providers about the issues that they face kind of independently of, of this particular process, just the challenges that, that we have. So I wanna send a huge thank you to them as well. Um, uh, as Council Member Kalantari Johnson suggested, and you know, and just say that um, we we know that there is a lot more work to do. Um, this is, I think, we're making a, an important step here in uh, responding to the last round and trying to figuring our our way forward. Absolutely thrilled the Community Foundation is um, interested in being more actively involved in because I think that they're they're focused on you know, really how to support resource, um, you know, under-resourced organizations and do more of the, you know, interactive and um, iterative uh, fund development, you know, going through that process rather than just, you know, fill out the application, get it in and we'll, you know, score you on a, on a uh, score sheet. So there's, you know, there's like all of these really, really, um, uh, you know, important programs that are getting funded that have been funded historically and there have been challenges. I mean, I just want to put it out there for the, just for on the council and also for people who are listening, the decision to uh, fold the set aside funds into the general fund for, for core is, I think it's a, it's, you know, I support that right now at this point. And, uh, you know, it ha in the in the previous round, it, ha it was very helpful uh, for, at least for my council member Watkins, if you have anything you wanna add, please do, um, to be able to be nimble, to address uh, uh, some of the gaps, uh, emerging needs, and then gaps where, and I think for seniors and, and, and children's programs in particular, where they didn't quite fit into the categories that had been established, or there was a reduced funding, and in some way um, that, you know, kind of multiply challenge some of those organizations, um, particularly the ones who get matching grants. So, you know, we were able to use that funding to kind of like fix some of the things that were, you know, not didn't work out quite as we had hoped. And so um, given that we're kind of in this next phase now, um, I, I do hope that we will we'll look at, and I understand we have our own resource um, challenges and fund, <laughs> fiscal challenges, um, but that we can seriously consider how to make this a priority uh, for increasing that pot of funding and working, you know, con making an additional contribution. I'm, I'm so glad the county is um, providing leadership on that. Thank you, Randy um, and your team. And um, so, you know, so there's there's a lot more to do, but I think that moving in is, um, is, is wonderful. And I'm looking forward to seeing how things um, play out in this next round. And, um, and you know, an another thing that I wanna say just really quickly, because, you know, the service providers, um, you know, it's, their, it's the nonprofit workforce in our community. These are people who, um, you know, have, who work and many of us have been in those jobs. There are no, you know, it, you don't get paid a lot. Um, it's a struggle to live in a community like this. And we have, we are so lucky to have uh, a robust community of service providers and people who are willing to step up 
And, you know, I really want to be involved in this conversation as we uh, look towards ways to, to bolster, um, you know, the, the nonprofit workforce as well. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, of, you know, really cool stuff happening in the, in the middle of all of this too. So um, I, I look forward to working with you all moving forward. Thank you, Mem Council Member Brown. Great comments. I think the only place you make less money is on the city council. <laughs> Dollar forty-three an hour is kind of what I think it's kind of about. It gets to. Um, well, thank you again to all the council members that worked on this. We do have a motion and a second. I see Vice Mayor Bruder. I just wanted to say I really enjoyed uh, learning and reading about the core investments and thinking um, about it as a funding model uh, for our safety net services and really as a means in uh, investing and addressing um, our community needs. So thank you to everyone that worked on this and um, I just wanted to express appreciation as well. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, we have a motion um, that's up on the screen here by Councilmember Colentari Johnson and seconded by Councilmember Watkins. And that is to approve the recommendation for the core investment term of three years to pursue the hybrid approach, um, but also include one deeper investment and ensure that the deeper investment is serving community members who reside in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, third part of the motion is to fold 45,000 of the set aside allocations into the core investment base funding, and then direct staff to return on November 9th with the core RFP and an update on the application process, technical assistance for applicants, review panels and scoring and award decision process. Um, Bonnie, could we get a roll call vote please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder, I believe, is still absent. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thanks again, everybody. Good to see you, Randy. <laughs> Okay, we will now move on to um, our next general business item. And this is item number 16, the City Cannabis Tax Children's Fund. This is a budget adjustment. Um, and I will um, provide, uh, turn this over to the staff in a moment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, so if you are interested in this, you'll wanna press star nine on your phone. Um, and then when I turn it out for public comment, and uh, welcome up, I'll welcome up Lindsay Bass, the principal management analyst for our parks and recreation department. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, council members. I'm gonna let uh, Tony make a few comments and then I will uh, begin a short presentation for you all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mayor and city council members. Um, for the record, Tony Elliott, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. And um, yeah, Lindsay Bass, our Principal Management Analyst with Parks and Rec, and will give the bulk of the presentation today. So uh, the item before council today is our uh, appropriation request for the Children's Fund. Uh, the Children's Fund, um, as the council knows, is 12.5% uh, uh, of our cannabis tax. Um, and so we have a uh, pretty clear, uh, I'd say a really clear direction in terms of how that Children's Fund is to be used. So our appropriation today, or the request for the council today, uh, is consistent with that uh, previous council direction um, uh, in terms of the split for those funds. Um, and this is also consistent with the city schools committee that we meet with on a quarterly basis, guided us on the use of these funds. So just wanted to provide uh, that high level context. Uh, so with that said, I'll turn it over to Lindsay for a short presentation on our specific request uh, for today. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. And um, you should all be able to see my screen. Um, this uh, table, summary table, is included in your packet. And I thought it might be helpful just to walk you through uh, a few of the particulars around the um, cannabis tax children's fund allocation that can be a little confusing. <laughs> so um, just to review, we do um, receive 12.5% of the cannabis tax fund revenues that are audited each year. An audit um, means that um, we tend to uh, program in the following fiscal year. So once those funds are audited and we know the actual amount that is there, um, we then uh, seek the appropriation. And so what's on the screen is um, how those funds have historically been utilized. Um, you'll notice that the funds have been growing um, as we've uh, moved forward in time. Um, and starting in uh, with the FY19 allocation, um, that fiscal year uh, 19 that was programmed in FY20 right um, during um, pretty intense critical COVID um, responses um, for families and youth. Um, we uh, moved forward with the 50-50 split, as Tony mentioned, um, to support early childhood education to Thrive by Three, as well as 50% to our Friends of Parks and Recreation um, nonprofit that provides uh, scholarships for financially impacted um, families um, and vulnerable youth. Uh, so you can see here um, the benefits and impacts of um, that funding, and just wanted to um, reinforce that the Children's Fund is really uh, an investment in the future. And um, the resources, whether they're going to early childhood development or to vulnerable youth through scholarships, um, really do provide a critical wind um, at the backs of families um, when it's most needed. Um, so we've received uh, testimonials from our FOPAR group in terms of the impact of those scholarships. Um, and you can see some of those here, um, as well as uh, the benefits of just that um, FY20 funds utilized by these two partner groups that we work so closely with, um, benefiting nearly 300 kids. Um, that doesn't include, you know, the families that also benefit from them being engaged, having programs to go to, um, having some consistency, um, being able to um, uh, go to work, uh, bring home a paycheck, um, as well as the early childhood um, centers that benefited from these resources as well. Um, so just a lot of great um, results from uh, the investment of these resources to date. Um, and I just wanted to review with you the appropriation that we are recommending today. So again, this is for fiscal year 20. Um, we will program the funds um, in uh, fiscal year uh, 22, actually. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a, an error there. Um, but the audited amount that we have in front of us is for 176,000. Um, 272, which will yield um, just over 88,000 to um, two different areas, so uh, early childhood development and then also to vulnerable youth. Um, in the conversations with partners and through the department's um, programming, we're also having some really uh, rich conversations about you know, how we measure impact um, of these uh, funds. So thinking about um, direct beneficiaries of the kids that we're supporting, um, understanding the composition of that population, making sure that we're tracking um, age, race, ethnicity, um, language uh, preferences, um, as well as the indirect beneficiaries. So um, families that are supported as well, um, and the number of sites that are receiving this kind of support. So. Um, so it's not a um, massively substantial amount of funds today. Um, those funds are incredibly impactful. Uh, we don't want to uh, place too many reporting requirements on our partners, but we do want to make sure that we are looking at how these funds um, are helping and impacting um, the uh, beneficiaries of the program. 
Um, and with that, I will uh, leave it with the staff recommendation. And we welcome um, any questions or comments that you have. Happy to clarify anything. Thank you, Lindsay. We'll go ahead and see if there are uh, any council members with questions at this time. I'm not seeing, oh, uh, council member Cummings. Uh, thank you all for that presentation. I did a somewhat related question since the cannabis tax is in the children's fund is being discussed. Um, since, uh, and, this, and this might not be for Parks and Rec staff, this might be for clerk or other staff, but since, since the, um, the sales tax measure didn't go on the ballot, um, I was just kind of curious when the tax fund was supposed to be put on the ballot, if that was gonna occur this year or next year. Um, because I know that we were at one point going to have that coincide with um, the recall election, which is now passed, and then I um, wasn't sure if there was going to be a special election specifically for that or if it was going to be put on another general election. So I was wondering if somebody could speak to that because I've heard um, conflicting messaging from members of the public and wanted to make sure that this was, it was clear um, what direction the, the next cannabis tax measure is going in. So oh, um, thanks for that question. Uh, Councilman McCummings, I'm going to ask Bonnie Bush to um, respond. Thank you. Um, yeah, back in June, Council adopted a resolution to place this on the November 2nd, 2021 ballot. Um, so it's Measure A. Um, there is a website, uh, there is a page on our website dedicated to Measure A. Um, so it is, it's technically not considered a special election because it is a designated date. Um, the question was always, is it consolidated because other agencies in the county might not have stuff to put on the ballot, which is where the whole cost came in um, because we can't split the cost with anyone. So that was the debate, but it is on November 2nd, 2021. Thanks. And then what are the costs associated with that? Just in case we get inquiries from them. Just want to make uh, sure we're not this, I, I'm, I think we're getting into an area where we're talking about something that's not on the agenda, but I'll look to Tony or Tony's. I, I'm not trying to shut down the conversation, but I'm just want to make sure we're not I talking can also, about it. I can also just send you an email, an email That'd be great. Yeah. for coming with, with the answer. That's fine. I mean, I think it's a judgment call, but it's, um, I, I think council's probably appropriate. I mean, a written update from the from the city clerk to start. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and take this out to the public. If there's no um, questions from council, we're now on item number 16, which is the city cannabis tax children's fund budget adjustment, and. Um, if you are interested in commenting, I'd like you to raise your hand by pressing star nine. I see we have phone number ending in 1810. You're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Press star six to unmute yourself, please. We're good yeah, to go. this is Garrett. Uh, this item suffers from much the same concerns as measure A placed on the is far worse, however, insofar as it flushed a ton of money forever lost down the drain getting it on the ballot. This policy here automatically earmarks future funds for a specific purpose by a policy here, and worse by Charter and Measure A, that forces the very highest priority specific somewhat unaccountable spending, possibly forever, and presents obstacles for future equally empowered elected council members to assign their own spending priorities. Is your wisdom permanently superior, no matter what, to that of future electeds? Why? Uh, the three and a half trillion Biden human infrastructure for families bill will pass in some form and will make measure A and this policy look very unnecessary. Uh, what's the rush? Uh, do you figure parents are spending too much time smoking the weed instead of caring for their children and you should they then pay more? Ha ha, or they should pay more. Anyway, a little joke. What other services uh, 
funded, you don't say. This kind of tax action should at least be an annual recipient performance and achievement standard reviewed allocation, but should not automatically be awarded, nor with an automatic fixed tax percentage benefit. This assumes that this funding follows a city's purpose, which I say it does not. The, the city should not take on an outside selective welfare role adding to the Fed State County efforts. It might even attract poverty here. Many budgeted items suffer from the lack of oversight and automatic create an ever bigger unaccountable spending. No one argues that early childhood experiences aren't critically important. Is the government a better parent than parents? Well, not lately, as evidenced by leftist public school curricula. This is also, in great part, a welfare affirmative action type assignment, one where city money is not used to provide services for everyone, but goes to a select financial needs minority. I won't go into much how welfare affirmative action type programs immediately devastated black American families after their introduction did lead black women to marry the government and black fathers deciding they didn't need to stick around to raise disciplined children, resulting in a population of illiterate, unsuccessful children who, by the way, still in poverty in the old school of government dependence. Thanks. Are there any other members of the public who would want to speak on item number 16 today? If you do, please star nine. I am not seeing any other members. Um, so we will go ahead and uh, we already have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Contari Johnson, seconded by Councilmember Watkins. And um, we will go ahead and um, wait, did we get a motion? We didn't get a motion. Do not have a motion. I was gonna say, wait a minute, you guys are you guys are doing too much work. I keep seeing the same names coming up here. So I would look for a motion. Um, on the item, please. Uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Watkins. Yeah, I'll go ahead and move this item. And it's just to say that it's really good to see that, um, you know, as this tax um, revenue goes up, that we're seeing more revenue going towards children's programs in the community. And um, having served on the city school committee, I know we've used these funds to help, you know, support scholarships for, for children in our community in the summer so they can go to summer camp and some of the summer programs. And so see how these funds can be put to good use to help children in the community. And so with that, I'll make, I'll, um, I'll support and move the staff, rec staff recommendation resolution appropriating the fiscal year 2020 audited amounts of the city's cannabis tax children fund allocation to the Parks and Recreation Department, 50% to provide by three, for early childhood development and 50% to after school care and scholarships for underserved youth education in Santa Cruz. Thank you. We have a motion by Councilmember Cummings. Councilmember Watkins? I'll second the motion and I'll just briefly um, share the comments made by my colleagues um, and in regards to the that the funding provides to our community and to our families and really extend my gratitude and thanks to our Parks and Rec Department, Lindsay and Tony our city schools committee and SOPAR, as well as um, the Thrive by Three initiative that has sort of taken on this administrative oversight allocation role um, without collecting any oversight kind of administrative dollars to do that. And um, that little bit can go such, in such a, so it can go so far for lives and families in our community. And um, it's great to see it being used in a way that feels really, um, nimble, but what's but so appropriate and, and won't lose its appropriateness as uh, we need to always continue to invest in our kids. So um, I will gladly second the motion and um, offer my appreciation and gratitude as well. Thank you, council member. Uh, I'll go ahead and echo too. Um, I really do think that even though many people say it's, this is not city's job, um, if we don't invest in the young people that live in our city, um, it's going to be really hard to, you know, have successful communities. So I really want to recognize the parks and recreation programs um, and the child care and the after school care that these funds provide. Um, those safe, safety net services really help kids kids be successful. And um, and then to top it off with doing things with our uh, rec programs and others, such as you know, it's just kind of icing on the cake to really take care of our, our youth, which is super important. So, um, Bonnie, let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins. Aye. Calentari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings. 
Aye. Um, Councilmember Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Um, I know we have a lot of people interested in our next item today. Um, we are running um, ahead of schedule today. So I'm gonna go ahead. I think we had kind of put some start times out to the community. So I'm gonna go ahead and have the council take a break. Um, and I think, um, Bonnie, did you, I don't believe we we have any um, uh, three minute speakers. Bonnie, did you do any additional outreach letting people know when start times are, it looks like a lot of people are tuned in, at least I'm recognizing a lot of the names from some of the communications we've gotten. Um, mm -hmm. Bonnie, did anybody contact your office regarding kind of the timing of this particular item? This is a homeless garden project item. Um, not our office, no, but we did have just a general estimate that could have been shared with people as they called in. Yeah. So why don't we, Council, why don't we take a 45-minute um, a break? So we will come back at 4 p.m. and um, we'll start item number 17. So those folks who are in the um, audience right now, um, We'll go ahead and take a break so that people who potentially were looking at late a little bit later in the afternoon that might want to join in this particular agenda item, uh, we'll start back up at four o'clock. Um, really quick, Mayor, um, just to confirm, you said a 45 minute. It's yeah, what time is it now? Back at four. I'm sorry, uh, it's back at four o'clock. Okay. So we'll, we are adjourned, the Santa Cruz City Council is adjourned until four o'clock and we will take up uh, agenda item number 17 then and that is the item on the homeless garden project. Thanks everybody. See you back then. Okay. If council members can turn on their cameras. You ready to roll? Uh, yes, we are, we're good. Okay. Vice Mayor, a minute here. Okay, we will go ahead and get started at four o'clock. Uh, good afternoon, we're re-adjourning for item number 17 on our agenda. This is the request from the Homeless Garden Project to amend the Pogonip Master Plan and relocate the site of the planned farm from the lower meadow to the upper main meadow in the Pogonip Park open space. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Please note, public comment will be limited to one hour today and each person will have one minute to speak. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, I also wanna confirm that um, I did uh, provide uh, three minutes to the Homeless Garden Project today. They will have two speakers uh, who will be using those times as well as I believe, Tony, um, they'll also be part of your presentation, correct? Okay, great. Um, okay, we will go ahead and get started. I will go ahead and introduce um, Tony Elliott, the Director of Parks and Recreation to start us off. And uh, I also see Kathy Calfo is here today. She's with the Homeless Garden Project. So Tony and, and Kathy, uh, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Department. 
Um, and with me today from Parks and Recreation staff will be Park Superintendent Travis Beck uh, and Parks Planner Noah Downing. Uh, and then from the Homeless Garden Project, Kathy Calfo and Executive Director Gary Ganshorn uh, will be here as well. Um, what we'll do in terms of the presentation is I will give uh, just a bit of background. And um, this is a background that the council is, is likely well aware of shared in previous meetings, but for the purposes of just uh, kind of setting up uh, our agenda item here, I wanna give some background. I'll share a little bit of the detail from the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting uh, earlier in the month of September, and then just give a brief, um, kind of very brief status update uh, on the contamination uh, in the lower meadow. And then I'll hand it off to Homeless Garden Project to go through uh, presentation. And then um, I'll conclude with a few remarks um, uh, as well on uh, regarding the process looking forward um, and some of the, the potential financial impacts. So I've got about 16 or 17 slides here that includes those from the Homeless Garden Project. So I'll try to move through these um, it's just lead, but, but in a thorough way uh, as well. So thanks for sticking with me here. All right, so I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, are you able to see my presentation? Yeah, we can see it, Tony, thank you. All right, All right. okay. So um, yeah, by way of uh, background. So I'll just start here. So the city and the Homeless Garden Project have been working uh, together for a long time, uh, over 20 years, to locate the farm, the Homeless Garden Project farm in the lower meadow. Um, the project was included in the 1998 Pogonet Master Plan and Environmental Impact Report, which guided development and the use for the property. The City and Homeless Garden Project approved a lease agreement in May of 2017 for the Lower Main Meadow, uh, and a planning permit for the farm complex was approved in September of 2018. The Pocono Farm is planned to include an administrative building, a uh, pole barn, equipment storage building, two greenhouses, and nine acres of cultivated land. Uh, in 2018, late 2018, Parks and Recreation discovered lead contamination in the lower meadow as a result of historic skeet shooting on the property. So in light of the contamination, the Homeless Garden Project is seeking an alternative location for the home of its future farm. Uh, included um, with the uh, packet for City Council today is a letter written by the Homeless Garden Project to the City Council, uh, which came in July this summer. Uh, with a proposal to amend the Pogonet Master Plan in order to provide an opportunity to move their farm from the lower meadow to the upper main meadow. And just to clarify, sometimes it's called the upper meadow or the main meadow, so we'll kind of use that term interchangeably, the upper meadow or upper main meadow uh, today. Uh, the proposal from Homeless Garden Project includes um, suggested text edits to the Pogonet Master Plan and conceptual site maps for the farm in the upper meadow. So at its August 24th meeting, anonymously provided direction uh, to do four things. So to direct staff to initiate an amendment process to the Pogonet Master Plan uh, for relocation, only for relocation of the Homeless Garden Project from the lower meadow to the upper meadow, uh, including outreach analysis and studies and environmental review. Uh, to direct staff to place a discussion of the proposed amendment on the September 13th Parks and Recreation Commission agenda, uh, which we did, and I'll cover that in just a little bit, uh, and to initiate an amendment process as expeditiously as possible and report to the council at its September 28th meeting on how the proposal would be incorporated into department work plans, uh, which is why we're here today, and a report on the amendment status to the council uh, three months. That was a direction from end of August. We're back here today um, uh, as directed by the council. So um, we met with the Parks and Recreation Commission on September 13th. Uh, the commission reviewed the proposal in the draft master plan amendment process uh, that we put forth. The proposed process is included with the packet today and available for the, the public. Um, and I'll provide an overview of the, the detailed contents of that uh, process a little bit later in the presentation. 
So the commission supported the proposed master plan amendment process by a four to two vote. Um, among the dissenting votes on the commission, concerns were centered primarily around environmental sensitivity of the upper main meadow, impacts to habitat, conflicts with the Poganet Master Plan's vision for the upper meadow to be preserved, uh, and concerns with the time and cost associated with the master plan amendments and related CEQA analysis. Uh, in addition, the commission and staff had the opportunity to hear from community members. So among those opposed, um, additional questions were raised regarding habitat, sensitive environmental resources, and also some concerns uh, as well. So all of that correspondence from the commission meeting as well as correspondence we received for today's meeting um, uh, is included uh, with the city council packet. So for the uh, city council and the public, um, I wanna briefly cover the, uh, the status, and I'm sorry, okay, here we go. I wanted to briefly just cover the status of the lower meadow uh, where we found contamination uh, in 2018. Uh, and just speak a little bit to the process that we are in the midst of. So um, in August of 2020, the state uh, Department of Toxic Substance Control, DTSC, um, evaluated and characterized the contaminants on the property. They provided um, something called a preliminary endangerment assessment, a PEA to the city. And it includes the soil testing results, analysis and recommendations uh, to the city. So the endangerment assessment identified areas that are safe to farm and recommended that a soils management plan be prepared. Uh, the Homeless Garden Project began soils management plan or site management plan with its consultant, Weber Hayes. Uh, the county, uh, so County Environmental Health has provided guidance that the plan describe how the site will be controlled to ensure that farm workers remain in areas uh, which um, have been identified as safe to farm. So those controls could include fencing, signage, training. Uh, so currently approximately four and a half acres, 4.5 acres of the lower meadow uh, could be farmed without remediation in the immediate term. So just wanted to flag that. And I'll share a map here in just, uh, just a moment. So in terms of that process on the contamination and potential remediation, Parks and Recreation staff expects a report from our consultant on October 15th, which will further delineate and characterize the lead contamination, which will set us up for the next stages in the planning, dealing with site management and plans for remediation. So we've got a, a process that we will go through related to the, the contamination uh, in the lower meadow. This map, uh, I just wanted to share, it may be difficult to see, I'm not sure how this comes through Zoom exactly, but um, generally speaking, the areas that you can see in yellow or outlined in orange are the contaminated areas. For a little bit of uh, some context, um, kind of at the bottom of the screen is Golf Club Drive, and you can kind of see it angling up toward the top left of the screen, which is the Pognum Clubhouse. The areas that are in green, there's an area that's about two or two and a half acres at the top of the image and uh, an area in green at the bottom of the image, uh, about two or two and a half acres. Those are the areas that are not contaminated that combined equal about 4.5 acres. So just wanted, to, again, to kind of ground the, the conversation in what areas are contaminated and um, uh, what is uh, not at this point, but clearly we've got a complex situation um, that we're going through uh, in a process to address this issue in the lower meadow. Tony, since you have that image up, maybe I'll interject just for the public. There's all, could you tell us what is the difference between something that's in orange versus something that's in yellow? Is that a, is that a criteria of contamination, like one's more contaminated than the other? Yeah, I would actually invite um, our parks planner, Noah Dapp, to speak to this. We have two main types of contamination uh, that have been uh, flagged as concerns by County Environmental Health. Uh, one is lead uh, from the, the shot from skeet shooting, uh, and the other um, are called PAHS, P-A-H-S, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which is a type of uh, carcinogen, is my understanding, uh, from the clay pigeon. Um, uh, 
from the historic skeet shooting. So I've got Noah on here and would uh, ask Noah to kind of describe the differences between these and Noah maybe where some of those, uh, the highest hits came from with those different uh, contaminants. Yeah, sure, Tony, thank you. Uh, so just to, to walk you through um, where you see the, the, the orange levels like B11, B11S, uh, just above West Meadow, just um, to the east of that would be where the firing area was. And so the orange is the skeet that was flung and shot down. And so that's in kind of an area of a uh, few hundred. The yellow would be where the lead shots kind of carried and fell. And so the highest levels of contamination are around the, the four to the 500 foot range. So EM10, EM11, EM9, that's where you're finding the hits. Um, I've seen, you know, the draft results from the October report be released, which has additional sampling points in the ravine area. And so just um, towards uh, EM10 in the, in, the, in the ravine, you could kind of see uh, a line which represents um, the highest points of contamination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Just to look at this get the sense of what, what the colors mean. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks, Noah. All right, with that, um, I will hand it over to um, the Homeless Garden Project, uh, over to Kathy um, and Derry. I think Derry's gonna talk. Thanks, Tony. Uh, my name is Derry Stanthorn, and I'm the Executive Director of the Homeless Garden Project. On behalf of the whole uh, Homeless Garden Project, I would really like to extend our thanks to the council members and to the Parks Commission members for your continued support of a permanent home for the Homeless Garden Project. The Homeless Garden Project provides transitional employment and job training for people experiencing homelessness. Over the last seven years, on average, 97% of our graduates have obtained jobs and about 90% have gone to housing. And I'm really going to just now pass it on to Kathy Calfo. Kathy is our former board president, the co chair of our successful capital campaign, and the chair of the Homes Garden Project President Committee. Thank you, Gary. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks, Derry. I just want to take a minute here since there's so many people tuning in but to really thank Ganshorn. She's been with the project for over 20 years. I've had the opportunity to work for, with her closely for the last 10, and I've never seen a person with more commitment, more compassion, and more effectiveness when it comes to helping people who are really trying to turn their lives around. So. Thank you so much, Derry, for everything you do and for making the project the success that it is. I just regret that I, like I said last time, that I'm here in these circumstances. Really appreciate the council's action, the Parks Commission action, and the Parks Department staff work in helping us sort through the situation we're in. I went through the packet, and there's a lot I could say right now, um, but I'm reminding myself that this is really the beginning of a process. Uh, to look and to determine where the best place at Pocanet for the Homeless Garden Project is. So like Tony, because we have an expanding audience, I'm going to review a little bit of what I went over last time. I want to review the history of the Homeless Garden Project and Pocanet, share some of the challenges that we've encountered from our perspective, and really urge the council to support the recommendation that the Parks Director is bringing to you today. So next slide is the timeline that we previously shared with you. Um, in 1998, approximately 12 acres at the, in the lower meadow, and that's out of 640 acres at Poganip overall, was evaluated in the environmental impact report and adopted as part of the Poganip master plan. Since 1998, the project under Derry's leadership has really developed its organizational capacity. It's expanded the program. The results that she shared with you, I think, are really unparalleled, uh, probably anywhere that you can think of. Um, she's expanded her budget, built an effective staff, 
and taken steps to prepare for the project having its first ever permanent home at Poganip, where eventually it will be able to triple the number of people it serves. The council, as Tony said, approved a lease of the desert for the homeless garden project back in 2017. After doing a lot of work, we obtained our design permit, a lot of work and a lot of expense for the project from the city in 2018. And in 2019, we moved towards conclusion of a capital fundraising campaign that raised $3.5 million, which I think is possibly a record in this community and really shows the deep support that the project has. We raised that money to invest in the city owned land at Pogan to build a permanent home for the homeless garden project, which Tony described a small administrative center, a barn and two greenhouses. And we had hoped to have somewhere between nine and 12 acres to farm down the program. As we got ready to break ground in January of 2019, we were ordered to halt construction based on the identification of possible lead contamination that dates back to skeet shooting that took place on the property in the 1930s and 40s. And it was never identified as an issue in the master plan or the EIR previously. So that came as a big surprise. Since the discovery, Tony shared with you the soil tests that have been conducted. I think I would have, make a little caveat about the term not contaminated. The Homeless Garden Project really, the board of directors spent a lot of time evaluating their responsibility to the community, to the trainees, to the thousands of volunteers who volunteer at the project in terms of possibly exposing them to lead. The that we, we're looking at farming was deemed as safe by us based on its meeting the residential standard. But there were members of the Homeless Garden Project Board who feel very strongly um, that no level of lead is really safe to expose people to. So that's an internal debate that we've had just as some background. Um, so when we realized that the lower meadow had the contamination, we did go ahead and hire a contractor who looked at it to give us an estimate. The farmland that Tony described seemed potentially viable, um, albeit there being concerns about the lead. The contractor looked at it with a new lens, running utilities and other, uh, other things that we would need, particularly uh, water and electric lines would involve going through areas that are more highly contaminated. So he was concerned about the overall viability of the site in light of that. So we began to look at the direction of the Homeless Garden Project possible sites at Poganip. Again, there's 640 acres of land there and we're coming at this with the premise that we can identify about 10 that would be a suitable permanent home for the Homeless Garden Project, which was identified as a key element in the original Poganet Master Plan. So if you go to the next slide, and I think this is important context, especially for people who haven't followed this closely. And I'll say that I was personally surprised as we began the evaluation and we're looking at sites. The site that jumped out to us as the most viable um, at this point is the Upper Meadow site. And the reason we came to that conclusion is that we looked at a comparison of the lower and upper meadow. The building site in the lower meadow is an area that's never been previously developed. The upper meadow site that we're looking at is near the old clubhouse and it's where the tennis courts and the pool, or pool was previously. So it would be putting the administrative center and the ancillary buildings on a site that's already been previously developed. In the comments that you received, there were a lot of comments about the coastal terrace prairie. Uh, at the upper meadow, we'd be converting about 3.5 acres. In the lower meadow, we've been approved to convert six acres and we'll be doing some other restoration to compensate for that as part of the conditions of the approval. Wetlands, there are none in the area that we're looking at at the upper meadow. There are multiple wetlands in the lower meadow. Uh, there are no slopes in the upper meadow area that we're proposing for farming. There's multiple areas that have slopes in the lower meadow. Tree removal is a big one for us. It was one we really paused at as we got our permit. 
when we were stopped construction, we had permits to do significant tree removal in the lower meadow, including more than 20 British trees. There'll be really minor removal in the building site if we proceed in the upper meadow. We've completed soil testing in the upper meadow and had no significant findings where you've heard what we found in the lower meadow. Um, electricity in the upper meadow, there's infrastructure nearby. We have challenges in getting electricity to the new the potential site in the lower meadow if we were to move forward due to the steep shooting impact. Uh, epic system is likely feasible. In the upper meadow, we'd have a forest sewer main required in the lower. And we'd have a contiguous farm area in the upper meadow where we don't have that in the lower meadow. So this is what led us, and I really want the community to absorb this, to come to you and to ask for consideration of an amendment. And as I said, this is the beginning of the process. So we expect um, that we will hear a lot, that we'll learn a lot. And um, I want to say that we want what is really best for Pogonit and best for the community. One of the foundational principles of Homeless Garden Project's program is really the healing power of the soil and of nature. And we're committed to being good stewards of the land at Poganip and of the people for it. Uh, I know I've gone on a little bit, but I do want to say a quick thing because a number of people have commented about the possibility of keeping the farm at our current site on natural bridges. So we sent uh, a note to the owner of the property who, as most of you know, has plans to develop much needed housing on the site. <laughs> he made it clear in that as he begins construction, he, that we can stay there, that's the good news, until he's ready to begin construction, but it is a temporary site. And he's also welcomed us to help in other ways if it's viable, possibly having a garden on his site. Uh, but there is not a place there for us to have the, the permanent home for the homeless garden project that we envision. So with that, I will close and thank everyone once again uh, for your help in moving this forward. Um, I also do want to say there's a lot of talk about, you know, visionaries in the 1970s who worked to protect Hoganip, and I'm kind of proud to say that I was one of those. I was a student at UC Santa Cruz at the time in 1979 when we uh, campaigned for the past to create a green belt in the city. And there are other people on the Homeless Garden Project board who have long been part of that, um, including Paul Lee and Mark Premack. So we get it, we're committed, we love Poganip, we love the Homeless Garden Project, and we really care about the community. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Tony, is that is that the, um, oh, you're gonna keep going, great. Uh, I'll keep going, I'll try to be brief great. here. No, that's um, fine, no, you've got plenty of time. I just wasn't sure if that was, so. Please go ahead, thank you. All right, yeah, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Kathy and Derry. So um, we took this item to the Parks and Recreation Commission, as I mentioned, uh, in uh, September, September 13th. And as part of the process, one of the core questions that we had from, um, you know, really going into that meeting is what, what is a master plan amendment process? So forgive me if this is a bit, a bit trivial, but for the community, I thought this was helpful in the context of the Parks and Rec Commission meeting and just wanted to share this again. Um, uh, in this form. Right? So some of the key ingredients that we think of um, as we go into a master plan amendment process, really start with public outreach uh, and feedback, um, but then move on to permits and planning, environmental review, and then reviews and approvals by public bodies like the city council um, and the Parks and Rec Commission. So those are just some of the key uh, ingredients. Um, in terms of some other examples um, of master plan amendment processes, uh, the first two examples that I have on here actually aren't really relevant to what we are talking about in these plan amendments. So the parks master plan and the wharf master plan were big giant planning processes really starting uh, largely from scratch and going through a, a really uh, comprehensive effort. So that's not what we're talking about uh, in terms of the plan amendment in this case. Um, what we are talking about is uh, much more in line with the um, master plan amendment process that we went through with Santa Cruz Shakespeare at De La Viga Park and the Emma McCrary Trail um, in Poganip around 2010. 
So we compared the process that we are presenting or that we presented to the commission that we're presenting here tonight uh, to the council just to sort of um, have that that sort of um, that check and balance. Are we are we proposing a similar process to what we've done historically? Uh, and the answer is yes. So really the, the process that we're recommending is almost identical uh, to that of Shakespeare and that of the Emma McCrary process um, a little bit over 10 years ago. So I just wanted to kind of give a frame of reference on uh, what we are proposing here. So it's not a, it's not a new process. Um, in terms of that proposed process, again, these are some of those key ingredients that I mentioned. Um, so in the early stages of our process, we're recommending that we address a lot of these key questions. Um, so we've been in the situation in partnership with Homeless Garden Project where we've um, encountered, you know, this, this major challenge with in the lower meadow. So as we go into this, we want to avoid surprises. We want to answer these questions um, that we've heard from the community and questions that we have among staff and even Homeless Garden Project. We want to be able to answer those questions early on uh, in the process. And while we do that, we also want to develop some guiding principles um, in terms of what these plan amendments might, might look like and how do we think about um, these different plan uh, amendments. So as we go through the process, we would have uh, draft plan amendments. We would get to a phase where we would have environmental analysis through CEQA. Um, we would have plan review and permitting, which would be done by the planning department. Um, and then an updated lease agreement uh, should uh, the farm site move um, into the upper meadow. So um, I'll just share here. I shared this in the last meeting, but again, just for the purposes of the community here, um, the Pogonet Master Plan provides a vision. Uh, the, the current plan provides a vision for the intended use of the upper meadow, which is to preserve and restore the meadow for the purposes of habitat and sensitive species and to renovate the Pogonet Clubhouse for education purposes and special events. So the Parks and Rec Department, along with the Planning Department, see the proposal from Homeless Garden Project as a potentially significant change from the current plan and the current vision for the Poganip Upper Meadow. So with that in mind, we recommend that consideration of amendments to the master plan include a really open and transparent public process starting with addressing these key questions uh, from city staff and those raised by the community um, as well. And then we recommend a, a proper analysis and studies and environmental review. So just wanted to be sure to mention that again. Um, in the council's packet uh, today is a, um, a process map. Uh, what I have here on the slide is that same process map, but it's in a different format so we can fit it on the slide. Um, what I wanted to uh, highlight here um, is the section in orange uh, with the first uh, steps over the first say 90 to 120 days or however long this, uh, this might take, but it's really this due diligence phase. So we have questions, again, as I mentioned, among staff. We've received a lot of questions already from the public, and I know we'll hear more uh, today. And we want to be sure to engage the community, go through public out uh, through a series of meetings, um, answer some of these hard questions that we're facing, um, and begin to develop some of these guiding principles um, that will lead us to uh, potential uh, plan amendments uh, that will be reviewed in the context of CEQA uh, later in the process. So that due diligence, I think, is really critical in these first uh, steps here highlighted in orange over the next three to four months or so. The process continues um, for this next slide, and this is where we get into more of the planning application, the CEQA review, um, and then some of the components related more to the planning department um, in terms of uh, building permit submittals uh, toward the end of our process. So. Big picture, uh, we estimate, and in comparison to both the Shakespeare Project uh, and the Emma McCreary Trail, we expect this to be approximately a two-year process. Um, uh, once it's all said and done, with the CEQA phase being a large bulk of that uh, of that timeline. So, um, looking again at the City Council's direction from the end of August, uh, part of the the direction from the council was to initiate the amendment process as expeditiously as possible and report to the council um, at this meeting today on the 28th um, as to how the proposal will be incorporated into department work plans. So I wanna talk just a little bit about what the impact for staff would be 
um, and a request uh, as well. So a couple aspects um, in terms of our workload, a couple aspects of our operations that we will pose uh, deferring or delaying um, are up on the screen here. That's completion of some of our existing capital improvement and grant funded projects that we had uh, planned for 2022. Um, these could be things like the San Lorenzo Park redesign effort that we plan to get into this year um, and possibly the Harvey West pool. Uh, feasibility study um, uh, work that we plan to get into this year. So we haven't pinned down exactly what that would be, but those are a couple of the projects that are carried over from previous fiscal years that are on the front burner, so to speak, um, for our capital uh, work this year. Uh, the second item that we'll need to defer is just uh, completion of a strategic review, our cost implications of deferred maintenance. Across the department, we know we have deferred maintenance, but we haven't put um, great analysis to that to understand what those numbers are, what that true value of deferred maintenance is. Um, uh, and so it's, it's a bit of a, a planning effort or uh, assessment effort that we'll look to uh, delay. Um, we will need some additional funding um, for a and a CEQA consultant as we go through this process. Uh, the cost for this type of work varies and we have detail on this in the staff report, but varies uh, generally between about 50,000 and 150,000. Um, so we are requesting as part of the recommendation today for an additional appropriation of $102,500 to be able to um, hire a planning consultant to help us go through this process and conduct uh, the CEQA analysis. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that moving forward, one area that would be uh, probably most helpful for staff would be council guidance regarding the responsibility for specific costs as we go through. Uh, staff has made an assumption that the Pocono Master Plan Amendment and CEQA costs uh, shall be borne by the city, um, but we uh, absolutely welcome um, and appreciate any guidance on, um, on costs um, and, and how to take those on. Uh, moving forward. So as we move forward through the process, staff is committed uh, to bringing forth any specific costs or operational impacts to the city council for your consideration uh, and direction as we move forward. So finally, I'll just leave it on uh, this slide and the mayor, I'll hand it back to you, but just wanted to summarize the staff recommendation, which is to review and confirm the process and timeline for an amendment to the Pocanet Master Plan to relocate the Homeless Garden Project uh, to the Upper Main Meadow. Um, and number two, a resolution amending the fiscal year 2022 budget, authorizing an additional appropriation to Parks and Recreation for consulting services uh, related to plan amendments and CEQA analysis. So that's our recommendation. Thank you for uh, your time and patience as I've gone through this. Uh, Mayor, appreciate it very much and happy to um, send it back your way and happy to answer questions when the time is right. Thank you, Tony. Let me just my off my mouth so I'm going to be twisting in here a little bit to use my mouth on my computer um i'll go ahead and look to council members for questions at this point um and then for the public watching we'll then bring it out to public comment and um i'm going to go ahead and give um a couple of folks who have three minutes uh have re requested three minutes um uh, speaking time to go first, and then I'll roll it into other public comments. So I'm just going to look for council to see if you have additional questions at this point for staff. Uh, council member Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you, Tony and um, Dari and Kathy for the presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, one question is actually to uh, maybe Kathy and, and Dari. Um, you know, last time we had the presentation, uh, I got the sense that there was a sense of urgency to, to move quickly um, as, as the project has been on hold for a while. So <clears throat> I'm just wondering what this looks like for you all now that we have a better understanding of what the timeline could be and that it could be up to two years. I'm just wondering what that, how that impacts the um, 
Um, uh, if Jer I'll start and maybe then Derry can chime in if she wants to add. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. Delays are not good, um, but we have raised the money. We anticipate that because so much time has gone by, we're going to need to raise more money. So it's likely during this time we'll do some of that. The urgency for the project is right now they're running a training program under the capacity could be. They're working on a farm that's beautiful, but has no running water or toilet facilities. And we don't know when the owner is going to get his permits and proceed with construction and we would have to be off the property. So that uncertainty is an issue. Our conclusion is um, putting some certainty to a that we won't have as we start this process, but we expect we'll gain it as we move through it. Um, will be helpful. It's not what we want, but it's really what we need at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I guess sort of just to just to keep going with that um, around uncertainty. Um, I just I wanted to get clarification, and maybe this is a question for Tony. Um, in terms of the process, um, we may go through the sequel process and find that we won't be able to do the project in the upper meadow. Is that is that accurate? Is that a possibility that we go through the sequel process and we find ourselves in a situation that we can't move forward with a project? I think that's a good question. Um, see if Tony Kandani come on. Welcome uh, any comments there. But I think what, again, what we hope to do, at least in the due diligence phase up front, is start to answer a lot of these really tough questions so that we don't run in or that, so that we can mitigate um, you know, the surprises or any issues that are gonna come later in the process. We wanna be able to engage the community early on and address some of those questions, but I'll, I'll send it over to Tony for any comments on that. Now the CEQA process doesn't dictate whether or not you can approve the project, but it will inform whether or not there are significant in, uh, environmental impacts, whether or not they can be mitigated to a level of uh, significance and whether or not there are alternatives that can achieve most of the objectives of the project that would lessen environmental impacts. And then lastly, if there are impacts that cannot be mitigated, um, the council has the ability to make what's called a statement of overriding considerations, which is essentially saying, we think this project is worthwhile, even though we understand that it will have some environmental impacts that can't be mitigated um, to a level of insignificance. So it's really a, an informant, informational uh, document more than it is, um, you know, a, a something that dictates how you uh, make a decision on the project. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And then my last question is, um, have we explored or can we explore cost sharing in terms of um, the planning and hiring of the consultant with the Homeless Garden Project. Um, 102,000 is a significant amount that we weren't anticipating um, that I'm not sure we'll, where we'll pull from. So uh, maybe we don't have an answer to that question right now, but um, just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other council members with questions at this point? I have a couple that I'll put out there if no one else, okay. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. Um, Tony, the, um, de the deferment of the projects that you mentioned, um, are those going to be deferred of the time commitment from our staff so you won't be able to basically do the projects because of that or is it because of match costs or I'm just trying to understand kind of that deferment. Is it people power or is it the money? It's primarily people power. Um, yeah, NOAA is our, our only uh, parks planner and takes on a lot of different projects. And so with his time commitment, as well as our park superintendent, Travis Beck, uh, we'll just have to analyze projects we'll need to, to defer. But the two that I mentioned, the pool and the San Lorenzo Park redesign, um, again, are two that we've carried over from last year and that are kind of on the, on the top of the, the priority list uh, heading into this year. But we have some flexibility with that. Some others include the Garfield Park uh, uh, renovations uh, or improvements. So there are a number that um, really come down to staff capacity uh, and time to, to manage. And are we in danger of losing any grant funds or anything like that, Tony, if, if those things don't move forward? Uh, on those specifically, no. Okay. Um, on those projects I mentioned, no. Okay. 
And I've reread most of the the EIR and the Pogonet Master Plan. The one thing that really strikes me is, um, you know, especially based on kind of a lot of thought, you know, the mapping in the in the plan is, you know, frankly, kind of cartoonish. Um, and so, you know, not unexpected. 23 years ago, if you looked at any master plan, that's what most of the maps look like because <laughs> um, they were done by hand. You know, um, when we think about due diligence um, ahead, um, at least from the upper meadow perspective or the main meadow, um, can you give me? You know, let's just pick the environmental, for example, you know, concerns a lot about, a, a lot of concerns about habitat, different habitat types that might be impacted. Do you expect, you know, having basically doing professional level survey work, um, so hiring a Paris, you know, prairie, you know, botanist, um, actually getting more accurate mapping done, um, you know, a lot of what's in the master plan is, you know, pretty, pretty rough. And so I'm just curious about what does that due diligence look like? And maybe you could just kind of help us understand that a little bit. You too, and I'll lean on uh, Kathy and Derry uh, on this a bit as well. So I know um, uh, short answer is yes. So we want that to be part of the due diligence is to understand from a, um, a really kind of a, a biotic assessment standpoint, what what is the nature of, of the upper main meadow at this point? So. The Pogonet Master Plan talks about it from a sensitive habitat standpoint, a sensitive species up there, but I would say at this point, um, I don't know that we have a great sense on what is actually present. Um, so I do think that there needs to be some, some analysis, certainly as part of that due diligence to understand, is it sensitive, uh, is it not, what's going on. Um, Homeless Garden Project has done some initial soil tests up there. Um, uh, to understand, um, again, if the soil is contaminated up there as well, um, and have also planned for a biotics assessment um, in the spring of 2022. So I'll, again, I'll lean on Kathy and Derry for any updates on, on that work that they're uh, doing. I think your report was accurate, Tony. That's, that's exactly what our thinking is, is that we have more work to do. We've had some preliminary questions that were somewhat positive, but not at all conclusive. Thank you. And then my last question, and I'm seeing that we may or may not have fire staff on right now, but um, I don't know, maybe Lee, I don't know if Lee is still on or not. Lee might be able to, you know, I was looking also, I looked through the whole uh, Parks Commission packet as well. And there was some maps in there, and Tony, you might know this as well, um, but by my count, you know, not all in the main meadow, kind of spread between the lower meadow and the main meadow. You know, there's some, I don't know, close to 32, 34 fires that were basically GPS. Um, I'm assuming a lot of those might have been associated, you know, camping fires. I'm not sure exactly what those dots represent, whether it was a fire that got started or whether it was the remnants of a fire or how those were, were actually identified. I'm just curious, what, how do we respond to that? I mean, is someone says, I see smoke, fire goes up there respond, but I mean, that seemed like a lot that just the number was pretty surprising to me, you know, um, surprising, but not surprising also, because I think, you know, many people in the community realize that Hogan is a place where a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of our homeless population does end up taking residence there because um, it's out of the way. Um, so I'm just curious, though, about what does that response look like? Um, who does it? you know, what happens when that happens? Yeah, I think that's a great question. If, uh, okay, Lee is on, and I'd welcome uh, Travis back as well. I know that a, um, uh, a periodic uh, kind of walkthrough in Poganip by park staff, uh, police department, fire department, uh, to evaluate conditions. I know there's a methodology behind what constitutes uh, a fire. I think there may be some factors in there regarding uh, fuel tanks and so forth. Um, I'm already speaking out of turn, so I'll send it over to Lee and and, uh, and Travis to speak about that frequency, that methodology, what it means, and, and the enforcement. So, um, Lee, I think you jumped on first, so I'll, I'll send it over to you. I'll, I'll defer to Travis if, if he's got better information, or I see that uh, Rob Odie is on the line 
as well. And so um, I think Rob would probably be best suited um, if he is available, but Travis may have additional information as well beyond what Tony was. I've seen that um, the app and the map as you were um, referencing Mayor Myers as well, um, but um, Travis or Rob may have uh, more of the specifics. Yeah, maybe I'll turn to Rob. Rob, I hadn't seen you on, so welcome, Rob. I'm not sure we do have Rob uh, on. I know he's, he's, he's showing here, but um, okay. I'm not sure he's actually on. So okay. if, if need be, we can follow up on uh, providing this, inf this additional information. That, that works for me. That works for me, unless Travis has anything to add. Uh, just a brief bit of information. Uh, the fire department in collaboration with Parks and Rec and PD has been doing regular surveys in Poganip and other open spaces since the beginning of this fire season and maps evidence of fuel sources, campfires, propane tanks, gas grills, et cetera. So those are the dots that you are seeing. And then, you know, there are actual fire incidents as well um, stemming from some of the, the camps there. And, you know, as the, the process is pretty much as you outlined, someone sees it, calls it in and, and the fire department responds. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Watkins. Hey, Mayor, and I just, um, just for clarification for the public, I mean, today really what we're being asked to do is to come initiate this process, right? Um, I mean, we're not making any decisions of moving the Homeless Garden Project to this site today. We're really just trying to give them the opportunity to be heard and to give them an opportunity to go through this process. Is that correct on kind of where we're at today in this thing? At Council Member Cummings, I would say short answer, yes. Um, and just the specifics today for the council uh, in the recommendation language are to endorse the process that we have put forth um, and to approve um, a budget adjustment uh, for additional funding for that consulting uh, work to help support the process. I just wanted to make sure that it was clear to the public that really what we're discussing today is trying to initiate a process so that we can have you know an inclusive public community conversation about the moving of the homeless garden project to the site, and that really you know we want you know ultimately we want to try to find the best path forward that's going to benefit not only the homeless garden project, which has been a really great asset supporting homeless members in our community and getting them out of homelessness, but also that we want to and uh, respect the community and kind of what their desires are around seeing minimum impacts to their environment and um, really trying to make sure we have something that's environmentally sustainable and also uh, compatible with the community interest. So just wanted to make sure that that was clear to the community, so thanks. I have Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for um, the presentations and the work on this. I, um, I, I just have a question, uh, maybe it's more of a clarification from Tony or the other Tony, Tony Kondati, but when, um, if we were to move forward, say, you know, fast forward a couple years from now and the CEQA process um, lends itself to identifying that, um, and I, I apologize, Tony, because I don't have the right legal list, essentially that um, it isn't the best move for the, up, for the upper meadow due to environmental impact. And you mentioned that in order for an override to occur, um, you'd have to have had assessed other locations, correct? Is that right? Um, the CEQA requires as part of an environmental impact report that the council analyze alternatives to the project. The project in this case would be defined as locating the homeless garden project farm up in the upper meadow. Uh, and so as part of that process, you would have to uh, identify a reasonable range of alternatives that um, that uh, meet uh, most of the primary objects. I would assume one of those alternatives would be to keep the homeless garden project location as it is currently uh, in the in the existing lease. So that's that's a decision that the council could make at a later time as well. And would that also include expansion outside of Pogonit specifically, or would it ne necessarily have to be, I mean, like, could there be anywhere, I guess is what I'm asking, or has, has that been considered? 
Well, that hasn't been considered, but yes, the council could consider alternatives that include locations other than the Pocono. I mean, I think, you know, to be fair, if if the council is, you know, if the council is amenable, well, let me rephrase that. Moving forward with an environmental impact report for the Upper Meadow is going to be a lengthy and expensive process. So I think it indicates the council's very serious consideration of that of that particular project. And you will analyze alternatives in the process. But as a and and until you've done that environmental review, you could not make a final decision on that as well. But it does indicate serious consideration of the proposal. I think. Okay. No, I I appreciate that because I you know you want to factor in all the things that you don't know and could you know maybe anticipate wanting to have thought about early on, right? So these little right. But one possible outcome at the end of the at the end of the process is that the council could you know select a different alternative as the environmentally superior project, which would of course entail then negotiating a you know a new lease, assuming it's on city property for that other alternative location. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say I I do have many many questions, many of which I don't think can be answered with the information we have available to us at the moment. So, but I I will have some a few questions. I just think hearing from the public and and sort of factoring those questions in as well would be good. So I'm going to save mine until after we hear from from. Great. Thank you, Councilmember. And with that queue up, I'll go ahead and take this out to the public now. I see one, two, three, four, five, six hands raised. If at this point, if you are going to speak, please go ahead and put your hand up so we get a a sense of how many people we have that are here to speak. And if you don't mind, if you could please keep your hand up as everybody makes their way through. That way, I know kind of how many folks I've got queued up. That's helpful for me. So the first people I'm going to invite up are Derry. I understand. Did you want the three minutes for your client, or are you going to take three minutes and then he will follow? There are two people. There's one organization and one client. Our graduate, Patricia Meekum, is available to speak, and also a representative from CCOS. Okay. And they, okay. So why don't we start with Patricia, if she's ready, and then we'll go with CCOS. I'll give them both three minutes. So, you know, if they go past that, they'll help, they'll hear a little bell, and I'll have them wrap up. So if Patricia's ready, maybe we'll have her go first. Derry? I have Patricia M. I'm going to assume that that's her, so I'll allow her to talk. Great. Welcome, Patricia. Press star six. There you go. You're ready to go. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Hi. My name is Patricia Meekum. Thank you for the chance to speak on behalf of this garden project today. I just want to say hi to Mr. Elliott. It's nice to see you again. I remember when you came earlier to the farm this year to visit, and just special thanks to Derry for the opportunity at the Homeless Garden Project. I am a graduate of the project. This program is no joke. This is an extremely organized personal development program and an opportunity of a lifetime for the right candidate. I entered this program 15 months ago while staying at a shelter. Today, I live in a spacious apartment. I work a full-time job in the home improvement industry, volunteer extensively in my community as well. The project attracts people that are really ready for change. People that stick will experience one of the best years of their entire lives transforming. With compassion, we are helped to carve out a defined path to housing and employment. Two years ago, after losing my home of 13 years from drug addiction, I became homeless. Night after night, I walked the streets and highways of Soquel, Capitola, and Santa Cruz. Rapport with other homeless drug addicts and got my first black eye instead. After months of living this way, thank God a good friend found me and took me to treatment. 
I emerged from rehab clean from drugs, but I was still homeless with a nagging awareness that more needed to be done with me. Then I learned about the Homeless Garden Project. I went to the farm in uh, June of 2020 and was told to show up on time for two weeks consecutively. If I could accomplish that much, allowed to continue training. I was so excited, I found myself literally running to keep my position secure at this farm and pass my initiation. Then I spent the next 12 months reaching milestones. Here, I learned how to push myself and ask for help. I started to actually focus and see the behaviors that helped me or hindered me. I was changing. Week after week of faithfully digging in the dirt, writing emails, planning, building a resume, harvesting kale, reaching goals, laughing, crying, surrendering, and praying, I realized I'd finally found the biggest help I needed to have lasting personal change at this farm. Nowhere else could I have accomplished this. And in the end, it led to housing once again, and to not just one, but even I cannot emphasize enough how this farm has been such a critical factor in my recovery from homelessness and unemployment. This place is world renowned and a local treasure. I am so honored to say I was a part of it. This thing is so much more than a garden. Imagine a crown crested with jewels sitting atop the Poconip. And I'll tell you what you're seeing is the garden project. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Next, um, we will have the speaker from CCOF. Um, and Barry, I don't know who that is or if they're if that is Judah. James Subi. Uh, what's what's his name? Five eight seven. Zero five eight seven. Two. And they're on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bonnie, I see Jane Subi. By name. By name. Oh, yes, I, I do, too. She's got a blue. Can you move her up? Great. Thanks, Bonnie. Welcome, Jane. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Jane. You've got a little bit of an echo. Um, if you have a device near you, you might want to mute that. Like if you're maybe listening in on your phone or your iPad or something, mute one or the other. Gotcha. I think I've got you now. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jane Subi. I represent California Certified Organic Farmers. You may have heard of us. We're CCOF. Uh, CCOF is a USDA accredited certification agency and nonprofit organization founded in 1973 here in Santa Cruz almost 50 years ago. Our headquarters are on the west side and we certify organic operations throughout North America. CCUF supports evaluating an amendment to the Pogo Nip Master Plan, allowing the Homeless Garden Project to relocate to the Upper Meadow. CCUF has been certifying the Homeless Garden Project since 2008. Uh, and what this does is we evaluate all materials, crops, and practices annually for adherence to the organic standards. And we also inspect the site annually. Being certified organic means that the Homeless Garden Project's growing practices are regulated under federal law and that they are required to, among other things, maintain soil quality in a way that avoids contamination of natural resources, including soil and water, These practices that maintain or improve biodiversity and not grow any GMO crops. Studies have found that organic farming provides many environmental and public health benefits because it builds high quality soils and increases soil organic matter, which sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. It also improves soil water retention, which means the soil holds more water like a sponge, reducing runoff and preventing soil and nutrients from being washed away. And organic farmers don't use synthetic pesticides, exposure to which can harm human and pollinator health. In addition to strongly supporting and certifying the Homeless Garden Project's stewardship of land and natural resources, CCUF staff are Santa Cruz residents. We know firsthand how needed the Homeless Garden Project services are for fellow community members who are experiencing homelessness. 
We are donors, CSA subscribers, and event attendees, and uh, Thomas Garden Project and uh, their plans for expansion. Um, we've taken the first steps of um, uh, considering amendments to the master plan. Thank you. Go ahead and open this up now to members of the public. Again, I'm just gonna um, work my way down the line here. If you do wanna call in, this is the Homeless Garden Project um, item. I'm giving um, all members of the public a minute to speak today. Um, and I'm gonna call out the last of your phone number. You're gonna wanna make sure you press star six to get yourself unmuted and then the time will start. So I'm gonna start out with a phone number ending in 0793. Hi, my name is Nancy Lushkajan. I wanna express my appreciation to both council and the Parks Commission for your action to support our project. I urge you items before you today. I spent five years as a consultant to the Homeless Garden Project doing a capital campaign feasibility study, guiding the capital campaign, and then guiding board expansion and development. As you know, as a result, they surpassed their initial goal and raised $3.5 million for the project in early December 2019. I've been in the nonprofit world for 35 years, 20, 26 years in Santa Cruz County, and rarely have I seen such an impactful organization. I was so impressed that I agreed to volunteer to head their board fundraising committee after serving as their consultant. Following year, I joined the board. It's essential that this model program be allowed to move to the nine acre garden in NIP, and I urge your vote in favor of moving forward as stated. Thank you. Next is phone number ending in 2406. Press star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Phone number ending in 2406. Sorry, can't. okay, sorry. There you go. Hi. My name is Carrie Mazur. I walked around the Upper Meadow this morning and read the notice asking for the community to protest this move. Many of the key points used habitat destruction and loss of wildlife as their organizing principle. I live on a small organic farm in the Santa Cruz Mountains, not unlike the Upper, upper Meadow. We are visited constantly by all manner of wildlife, including owls, hawks, and bobcats, in addition to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds none of which I saw in my walk around Poganip today. I also observed that the meadow had recently been mowed. Mowing a meadow visits havoc upon the creatures that live there. I would posit that a well-tended organism may increase by biodiversity of the site. The current HGP garden is an open and welcoming place. At Poganip, it will be more so. Imagine visitors seeing unhoused members of our community out of their tents, at work growing organic food and learning to be self-reliant. They are joined by volunteers and members of the public harvesting vegetables and flowers to take home. All the while, hawks continue to soar overhead and are now joined by the flittering of butterflies and bees. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Delise Weir. You can press star six to unmute yourself. We'll go ahead and let you get started. Okay, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? You yep, we can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. So I am just a mere community member. I've not, um, I volunteered with the homeless garden before, but I'm also a master gardener and a small farmer. And I'm also um, sit on the board of the friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden. So I'm well versed in the importance of good soil for raising food and um, the importance of that to agriculture. I'm also the, 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 the aunt of an unhoused young man who recently died. He lived in Vallejo. And I know that the uh, Homeless Garden Project is a model program and I tried to get something like that started for him in Vallejo. Um, unfortunately, he died um, without access to something like that. But it is an absolutely essential set of services that are benefit the, uh, the housed and the unhoused community. They, they deal with um, food insecurity for the unhoused and the housed. 
Um, I urge you to approve this, and they must increase their capacity with a larger piece of land. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have phone number ending in 5725. Go ahead and press star six, and you can get started. So can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you. My, my name is Rebecca Sakli, and I'm a longtime City of Santa Cruz resident. I do support the work of the Homeless Garden Project, but I do implore them to stop pursuing this controversial move to relocate to the upper meadow of the Poconos. I feel confident they can find another location that will have less environmental impact and that the community can support. City Council members, I urge you to vote no on the motion. Placing the Homeless Garden Project in the Upper Meadow cuts out the heart of the crown jewel of the Green Belt. This allocation of funds will be the first of many hundreds of thousands of dollars that will be required to pursue this divisive project, and this is not the way I want my tax money to be spent. Thank you for your consideration. Next up, I have phone number ending in 7767. Go ahead, please. Press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sally Shepard. I'm a longtime supporter, volunteer, former board member, and also I helped in some small way it, on the capital campaign. I'm passionate about the Homeless Garden Project. So I'm not going to try and make an argument for why this needs to happen. I'm going to say thank you for setting up a really good process for how we can get all of the questions that so many people have answered to make the right decision to help the Homeless Garden Project find its new permanent home. I think we can all agree on that, that a permanent home for an organization that's done great things and is looking to expand their services is what we all want to support. So thank you for setting, taking the time to set up the process. Thank you for hearing us and, and Godspeed to the process. Thank you. Next is phone number ending in 8696. Press star six to unmute yourself and you can start. Hi, my name is uh, Sheila Cummings. I'm a community member and a long-term volunteer at the Homeless Garden Project. I'm not the best person to address um, some of the environmental concerns or the logistical concerns that some people may have, um, nor am I the best person to attest the transformative effect the garden can have on many of its participants' lives. What I do want to address is a concern that is sometimes unarticulated, but actually underlies many of the other concerns. And that is that because the garden, homeless population, that somehow having it in Poganip will create an unsavory environment. I've been returning to volunteer every Friday morning for the last three years at the garden. I wouldn't do that if it wasn't a nice place to be. <laughs> That's the main point I wanted to make. And if you guys understand that it's a beautiful place to give to the community, I think we can resolve the other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Patrick Williams. Um, Mayor, just so you know, I have to promote him to a panelist because he has a an older version of Okay. He's on a landline, Bonnie? No, he's just on an old version of... Oh, of Zoom. Okay. Hi, Mr. Williams. You should be able to speak now. Star six. I'm 
Mr. Williams, you should be able to speak. You look like you're unmuted. He actually looks like he doesn't have audio. I can't see that from my... Um, why don't you leave him in, um, Bonnie, and see if we can troubleshoot that, and I'll go on to the next person and come back to him. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll go on to uh, caller ending in 3485. If you could unmute yourself by pressing star head, please. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Gaffney, and I've submitted detailed written comments to the council that I hope you've had a chance to review. I'm here tonight to ask the council and the leadership of the Homeless Garden Project not to pursue the idea of developing the main meadow of Pogan and open space, and instead to work together on other alternatives that can meet the needs of the Homeless Garden Project without causing the multiple significant environmental impacts with converting coastal prairie habitat at the heart of the Poganip to agriculture and can therefore be supported by the whole community. To quote the author, C.S. Lewis, progress means getting nearer to the place you wanna be. And if you've taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. I respectfully urge that the idea of relocating the homeless garden project on the main meadow of Pogonip open space represents a wrong turn that would end up being costly, time consuming and divisive. I ask you not pursue it further and instead seek a better path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is, uh, let's see, is, oh, Patrick's got his hand up. Okay, Patrick, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, my name is Patrick Williams. I worked with the Homeless Garden Project close to 14 years, both as the horticultural director and also as the farm manager there. I started back in the very early 90s. And uh, when I applied for the job in my job interview, I was told that the project would be soon to the Poganip. So that is now a generation. A generation has passed while the project has been waiting for this move. I definitely uh, hope that the city council will hear this and uh, move in a positive uh, position. Now, one other thing I want to point out is that I now have a small project in southern, uh, in South America, in Colombia. And I was watching television a couple on uh, TV Agro. And one of the interesting things I came across, there was a program on a homeless garden project in the city of Cali, which was basically patterned Patrick, after the homeless garden project. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Next, I've got Chrissy. You can press star six and you can start. Hello, uh, my name is Chrissy Brewer and um, I, with Patrick, was um, a garden director in the early 90s um, until 2001. Um, I saw the project um, blossom. We, you know, also were um, ensured that it was Poganip. One thing I'd like to address, and I, I encourage the council to approve this um, uh, this move to the upper um, meadow, but I would like to address some of the um, I, what I hear as um, objections to the homeless garden project being out there, and that is that it would encourage more folks living homeless to then be uh, gathered in in that area, and. We have always had a policy at the Homeless Garden Project that our trainees um, not live on the property, that um, they are um, um, not uh, uh, allowed, I guess, to be, you know, in um, living there. And please, I, I, um, I encourage you to accept the, um, the proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I have April Wilson. April, if you press star six, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and talk. Like you're still muted, April. If you could press star six, that should unmute you.
April, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to the next person. Um, oh, oh, there you go. You're off. You're mute. Uh, you can go ahead now. Where'd she go? There she is. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is April Wilson, and I have um, been with the Homeless Farm Project since 2016. Um, I am a graduate, and I can be involved myself with the Homeless Project. And I am, um, so thank you for having me. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the homelessness here in Santa Cruz is a growing issue and there's not very many opportunities or programs to help those of us experiencing homelessness. However, thankfully there is this program um, which has given me a safe, wonderful place to be where I have been able to learn a lot of new skills, work on myself and Homeless Garden has given me the support and confidence to build on and to help me and us uh, other training. Thank you, April. Thanks. Next, I've got someone with the letter M for their on their phone. Press star six and you can get started. Hello, my name is Maurice and I'm a Santa Cruz native with over 15 years of residence. This year, I volunteered over 80 hours with the Homeless Garden Project doing farm work. I've personally experienced how friendly and supportive the HGP staff is. With that being said, I support the city looking into HGP moving to the upper meadow of Pogonet. Thank you, Maurice. Next, I've got phone number ending in 7496. Good afternoon. And this is Matt Farrell and uh, I just want to thank the council and uh, Parks and Rec staff and the Parks Commission for the work they've done on considering this proposal. I think it's the right step forward and I urge council to adopt it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Matt. Next, I have Sheila. Star six, Sheila, and you should be able to, to speak. Sheila, we hear you. If you could press star six, we can we can get you going on your phone. Sheila, I'm gonna move on to the next caller. I'll come back to you to see if we can get you unmuted. Uh, okay, uh, I'll go ahead and call up Suzanne McLean as our next speaker. Just press star six to unmute yourself. Bonnie, is there something going on where we're crossing paths? No. Go ahead, no, Suzanne, excuse me. you're unmuted. Thanks. 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 Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. If you have your iPad or computer or phone on, just mute that. You're yep. looking at it. There you go. Yep. Thanks. 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 Um, are you speaking on? How about now? There you go. Perfect. Okay. So this is Suzanne McLean. Thanks to the City Council for the opportunity to speak in the Garden Project. I've been a supporter of the Homeless Garden Project for a number of years, mainly because they provide tangible results in moving people out of homelessness. In addition to the training and support services, the Homeless Garden also provides the community, supports the community by distributing large amounts of produce to nonprofits throughout the county. It's critical that we support this organization and expand their reach by establishing a permanent home for the farm. I'd like to thank, to thank the City Council for their support to date. I would appreciate your home and evaluating the best place for the Homeless Garden to continue to do their great work. Thank you, Suzanne. Looks like Sheila, did she, she might have left. Looks like Bonnie, I'll see if she comes back on. 
Okay, I'll go next to phone number ending in one six. Press star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Evan Jones. I'm the program manager at the Homeless Garden Project. And I just wanted to first and foremost thank everyone for having this opportunity for the public forum. Um, also wanted to emphasize the mission statement of the Homeless Garden Project, that in the soil of our urban farm and garden, people find the tools they need to build a home in the world. And I'm here this afternoon or this evening just to amplify the voices that have already spoken about that mission statement, um, whether it's Patricia or other graduates. Um, being boots on the ground and seeing these individuals work on the farm and accomplishing their goals is really impactful on an individual basis, but I've seen it expand beyond that and affect the community in such a large, powerful way. Um, one young man just graduated last Tuesday, and the very next day he started a job that he got through connections um, that he gained at the Homeless Garden Project. So having a permanent space and an encouraging space to get growth and momentum would be um, invaluable for, for the community. So I support the public process to evaluate the move to the upper meadow. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I've got phone number ending in 1810. You'll have one minute. Uh, I haven't heard any answers to the many good questions posed by public letters so far. Just an organized mass phone in by the HPG uh, supporters. Nonprofits can abuse their donated funds, funneling money to overhead. Looking over the IRS 990 forms raises questions for me. I question, does any of the yearly half million plus of salary expenses overhead stated pay the homeless to farmers trainees or to whom for what? And then also the selling of some of the production on the open market, I assume called net inventory sales, seems possibly in direct competition to for-profit farmers. Are, if so, the homeless then are on-the-job employee trainees at what pay? If they do compete in product sales and the government's part of it, that is socialism. HCP must provide a service to the community that otherwise would not occur for tax avoidant purposes, but this seems different. Do we have here a permanent giving of public land? How would the land be returned? What performance conditions are required? Exactly what is the cost for individual restorers to complete financial independence, including donations, volunteer, fair market cost of the land lost to public use over time and Thank any you. other That's city expenses? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, phone number ending in 1840, sorry, 43. Press star six. You mean, you mean oh, oh, eight, oh, eight, four, six, I'm one. sorry, zero eight. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. oh, well, thank you. Yeah, my name is Michael LaFoon. Um, I'm, I'm a tr trainee graduate from 12 years ago with the Homeless Garden Project. It helped turn around my life. I'm actually currently on the board of directors. Um, I think uh, moving the project to the Upper Meadow would actually be an enhancement and a great improvement to the Upper Meadow and not a detriment, as many of the opponents say. Um, I think that also uh, having the Homeless Garden Project located up there may provide enough synergistic energy to finally rehabilitate the clubhouse, which has been sitting boarded up and rotting for you know the last few decades. Um, I think the people who oppose this, they want less community involvement and fewer people up there. I think more community involvement and, okay, thank you thank very you. much. More community involvement is better. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I have uh, phone number ending in 3467 now. Hello. Hello, go ahead please. Hi. Hi, my name is Nancy McLean and I reside in Hollister, California. Um, I encourage you to appropriate to, for the appropriate action to enable the Homeless Garden Project to relocate the Poganek site from the lower to, uh, to the main. Um, this is a project that I have supported for years, including volunteering and attending fundraising events uh, for more than six years. 
The Homeless Garden Project is on the forefront of providing a pathway out of homelessness and a future for many of the Santa Cruz residents. With strength and community and council support, it will assure a successful perpetuation that will serve as a model for other communities like mine. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next, we have Rachel O'Malley. Please press star six. Hello, um, I sent a letter separately expressing my three decades of support for the Homeless Garden Project. I'm also a professor at San Jose State where I teach sustainable agriculture. And, um, I'm a biologist and I did my PhD on rice wetlands comparing natural systems with agricultural systems and even the organic rice, which is better than conventional rice, even winter flooded rice fields are not nearly as good for wildlife. They, they, we know now so many impacts that farms have on natural systems. It, it's um, very dangerous to try to move tilled land into our last coastal terrace prairie. It is um, also very, I, I wanna really strongly encourage you to not move forward with today's decision because I suspect as I was, you were surprised at how controversial it turned out. Moving forward without considering working with the Homeless Garden Project, taking $100,000 with legal, it's gonna be a lot more. Give it directly to the Homeless Garden Project. Hold on, thank you. Thank you. Next is phone number ending in 7163. Press star six and we can hear you. Seven one six three. If you press star six, we should be able to hear you. You're still muted. Okay, um, I'm going to move on. I'll come back to you. Um, I'll need you to unmute yourself. It looks like you're unmuted. Maybe now. I'm not sure. I'll move on to the next caller, Colin Hannon. And if you could please press star six to unmute yourself. We can't we can't hear you. If you could please press star. There you go. I think I think now. I've got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Colin Hannon. I'm, I've lived in Santa Cruz for 20 years, so I live in Davenport now. Um, I just heard about this plan a few days ago and it boggled my mind uh, to think of developing that open space out there. I don't think that the farm, the farm program should be supported and should find a, a really wonderful home, but that does not seem like the place um, to take one of this, this amazing open space um, and, and do that there. Uh, and I don't think there's any question about danger or, or, or you know, unsavoriness of the place or anything. I think we all, I, we all want to support the Homeless Garden Project. And I don't think there's any danger that that site is is so special and undeveloped, and there's so many impacts to to the natural space there and our open space that, that there's got to be a better place. Um, so I hope that uh, you'll consider that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's come back to caller that ended in 7163. It looks like we may have lost them, Bonnie. Uh, hung up. I don't see. Yeah, I don't see them. Okay. I'll go to phone number ending in 4469, please. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Hank. Can you hear me? Yes, we can We can hear you. Okay, I am a uh, born and raised native of Santa Cruz and I'm also a wildlife biologist. Um, I am not in support of the proposal to move the pro garden project to the main meadow site um, as I feel it's not consistent with the original intent of our citizens to protect the area for wildlife and outdoor recreation. This project would irrevocably change this fragile coastal prairie and alter human use that's already established, um, that of outdoor activities. So 
Cognip is a wildlife corridor and it connects a network of wildlands across a larger landscape, providing habitat for rare plants, nesting birds, and large roaming mammals. Um, and I'm greatly concerned by this lack of public outreach. I mean, I just heard about it last week. Um, and I'd like the city to review alternatives, not as a garden project, but maybe some restoration activities that could happen um, in the Poganip. Um, we need to understand the full cost and the environmental impacts of fragmenting this area. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 6483. Hi. Hi, Jim Tui, and I'm the cell coordinator for community involvement with the Bay School, and we are a student uh, school for students with autism. And I just wanted to expand um, on a subject that I haven't heard yet, and that is that the Homeless Garden Project does an amazing job kind of broadening their, spo their scope and reaching out and being just a great place for job training for a lot of people with disabilities. And we have a relationship with them where a lot of students who wouldn't be able to be in an indoor location or a more crowded location, their first step into community involvement is at the Homeless Garden Project. So um, with everything being mentioned, I did want to uh, call attention to the fact that it is an invaluable place for students with disabilities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have a uh, caller. Uh in, or, I'm sorry, uh, with the name Jacob Pollock. Press star six and you'll be unmuted. Jacob, if you could press star six, you'll be unmuted. We'll go ahead and move on. Jacob, if you wanna still hang on the line, you, but you'll have to unmute yourself in order for us to, to hear you. Uh, next, I've got phone number uh, ending in 0983. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is Jacob Pollock. He was I, I couldn't get it, the other one, but the same person. Anyway, um, okay, I'll make great. it quick. We got a minute. I, I think you shouldn't go ahead with this uh, with the the project at hand. It, it costs too much money. And previously, we already went through this whole thing about uh, should we develop the Pogonip, and we agreed to put the homeless garden in the lower half. Changing the upper half is a big change, and it's going to really mess with the open space character of the land. I know people look in space and think, what can we do with it? But it's already being used as open space. The other thing is I don't think this is a referendum on the quality of the homeless garden. It's a great institution, absolutely. The question really at hand is what's the proper place to move it? And I don't think it's the upper meadow. That's basically it. I wrote a longer letter uh, that you can read at your leisure. Thank you so much for all. Uh... Thank you, Jacob. Next up, I have Greg Hayes with phone number ending in 0983. We can hear you. Okay, great. Yep, you said it. My name's Gray Hayes, and I'm speaking on behalf of the group Friends of the Green Belt, also known as FOG, or FOG. We support, all of us, every one of our expanding network supports the Homeless Garden Project, but the proposed project is not appropriate for the upper meadow of the Poganip. I want to alert you that we have retained legal counsel to represent our group with regard to this matter. You can find our attorney's letters in the agenda packet, pages 17.233 and again, 17.52. For the reasons stated in our attorney's letter, no action should be taken in studying this particular site any further. Hey, um, has the city considered the grant application that they signed and the agreement with the state of California for what the Poganip could be used for? Do you really want to open that conversation? We don't. We'd love for the Homeless Garden Project to stay where it was previously dedicated. But opening this question, this door, which we'll do after this meeting, falls into that question. Please do not move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Enda Brennan. Do 
Just press star six and you'll be able to speak. And then we're not hearing you. I'm wondering if we have you on a phone line also. Um, Bonnie, are some of these folks maybe showing up as phone numbers and their, and their names, it seems like? Um, it's possible. I would have no way of knowing, though. Yeah. And uh, um, there you go. We can hear you now. Um, okay, I'm un unmuted at this time. Can okay, you guys hear ahead. me? So my name is Enda Brennan. I currently serve as Vice President of the Homeless Garden Project. And I'm one of your downtown commissioners, one of seven that uh, represents you in the downtown area of Santa Cruz. I want to commend all of you for your unanimous support in the, in the last meeting that you had. You did a deliberate decision to ask for public comment through Parks and Rec, which was absolutely the right thing to do. And um, I'm sure any of us that actually are aware of the politics of Santa Cruz realize that there was going to be some pushback on this move. But the reality is that the Homeless Garden Project needs a home. We've needed a home for uh, 33 years, actually. And this is our best opportunity. This is going to be a careful, deliberate process that you guys are engaged in. And I just encourage you to stay the course of a careful, deliberative process, which involves tons of public input and community input and considering environmental concerns, please do your unanimous support. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 4586. Hi, good afternoon. Go ahead, Hi, please. Good, good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is Terrence Willett. I've lived in the county for 34 years. I just uh, work at the Birch and Plant Homeless, and I'm well aware of how disconcerting that can be and how we need uh, homeless services. However, uh, Poganip uh, was purchased with the intent of being open space. We went through uh, this decision making 20 years ago. It was quite controversial. And I'm asking the uh, uh, council, you all, to uh, respect that prior decision uh, and respect the will of the voters to keep Poganip as open space. And instead of having a new controversy that costs money, have us focus our mind a new appropriate owned. Uh, place for the homeless garden project so it can continue its good work. Thank you. Thank you. And then the next caller I have is ending in uh, last four digits, 6679. If you could unmute yourself and then we can speak. Hello? Can you hear yeah, me? We, we can hear you. Hi, uh, my name's Paul Goldberg. Um, I'm the development director with the Homeless Garden Project and a community member here and uh, um, who lives up in Ben Lomond. And I just want to underscore one point on the fire risk. Um, uh, as noted, there were all those fires in the Pogo Nip. And um, part of this project will include HDP, a nonprofit, funding a water line big enough for fire protection to the site. So there is an incredible benefit on top of everything else we do um, to the community in the sense of fire protect protection. So please do move forward with this project. Thank you. Bonnie, how long have we been going? I think I counted about 24 or 26 speakers. Um, I did not write down exactly when we started, unfortunately, but I'm not seeing any additional hands. Uh, but I do think we have time for additional comments if anybody has those. Um, so I will make a last call for any other public comment on this item. If you do want an item, you'll need to press star nine and raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, we will bring this back to council for deliberation. Okay, I've got two more phone numbers, 0480. Go ahead, please. Hi, good afternoon. We can hear you. Hi. Awesome. 
Hi, my name is Brendan Mealy. I'm a parent, property owner, and resident of the city of Santa Cruz. I'm the past president of the Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau, and I'm currently the chief operating officer at Second Harvest Food Bank, Santa Cruz County. The mission of the Homeless Garden Project and the Poganip Farm will directly provide solutions to many of the systemic root causes of food insecurity in our city. I've been involved with the Homeless Garden Project since 1995 as a UC Santa Cruz student. I have 18 years of experience managing commercial organic farming operations and have been a consultant on the project and the Poganip Farm design. I appreciate the city's commitment to the farm's original site and the project and would advocate for the city to move forward with the park staff recommendation to evaluate the process of the proposed move from the lower to upper Poganet Meadow. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have phone number 8701. Press star six and you'll be unmuted. Hello, my name is Patrice Boyle. I am a past um, Board member of the Garden Project, I am a downtown merchant and longtime resident of Santa Cruz. The, I just want to say that the Garden Project tackles and signifies a vast array of issues, including the dismal state of our natural world, the dismal state of our corrupt food system, the growing and long-term and tragic issue that is homelessness, and the unequal distribution of opportunity, even to members of our own community. The upper meadow next to the campus will be an ideal place for the garden project. It is flat, it's not toxic, and it's already been developed. Cassie Cal posed excellent previous site comparison at outlines additional good reasons for this. In the non-industrial hands in the dirt restorative gardening of the garden project, it's really good for people, but it's also good for the soil. And it will provide habitat for indigenous flora and fauna populations that are not currently supported. For decades, the city of Santa Cruz, the city council, after city council, including this one, have supported and encouraged the garden project to follow this plan. I urge you today to continue in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public um, that do want to speak on this item. Okay, I've got Sylvie Childress, please. Hi, can you all hear me? We can hear you. My name's Sylvie Childress, and I would like to urge you to reject the proposal to move the Homeless Garden Project to the Upper Main Meadow. Upper Main Meadow is a very special habitat, one of our last remaining places of coastal prairie habitat, and the, the question at hand is not whether or not the Homeless Garden Project is a worthy organization. The question at hand is whether this is the appropriate location for it to be permanently. And I, I would say that it is not, and there's already an EIR that has been location from, the, um, from 1998 that uh, says that this meadow is not an acceptable location for a farm to be held. Uh, there's many sensitive habitats there and reasons that it shouldn't be there. Um, so please reject this proposal. Thank you. Bonnie, how are we doing um, how are we doing on time? Did you take a note? Um, we I'd say we have about six minutes left. Right. Okay, that's about what I calculated. Okay. Uh, we have a caller with the name J-H-O-N-D. Please press star six and you can go ahead. Thank you. Hello, Hello. can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. If you could turn off your uh, whatever device you may be listening on. Um, um, well, I'm on, I'm on a computer. Okay. Um, so, okay, uh, so uh, my name is Mr. Golder and I sent you a letter by email, five page letter detailing what, what I'm gonna skim over real quickly here. Um, the main thing, uh, the main things I wanna say here is that the Homeless Garden Project has had 24 years since uh, from 94 to 2018 since their present site was selected, 20 years since the Poconet Master Plan was approved in 98 and 11 years since the book Jewel of Santa Cruz was published in 2007 a book displayed a picture of the skiat range with a background, the upper slope of, of the uh, uh, lower meadow. 
So they have 24 to 11 years to do their homework known as due diligence, and they haven't done it. Complete bailout of that site with costs running into hundreds of thousands of dollars. But by far the most impactful, the effects of this site change, if any part of the former 9.3 acre polo field is used, the city will lose its last large flat undeveloped area to site a sports field group of four full-size adult ball fields, which we've needed for more than 30 years. The city has built one ball field in 60 years and they screwed that one up and paid a million dollars. So I'm asking you, uh, and to get a similar site in the city, and the only site available would be West Side Industrial Lands, would cost $18.6 million at the present you, cost sir. of land. We got this Thank one you, for $44,000 an acre from Thank the state. You, so I. Great. Any other? We have time for maybe one more comment. I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm going to bring this back to the council now. Uh, and I will um, call on Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everybody who has uh, shown up and spoken up today. I, um, you know, I the comments I'm hearing really resonate for me uh, with me, and and um, I think we're we're all agreed, <laughs> or there seems to be some, you know, one thing I'm hearing is agreement that this is going to take time. It is going to um, take resources and cost money. And, um, you know, that's something that we have um, at least, it, you know, in our previous action suggested that we are interested in pursuing and that we have a commitment to the, uh, finding uh, a home for the Homeless Garden Project in the Pogo Nip. It's unfortunate that, you know, we, we didn't, the plans that were made, um, you know, are not working out that, you know, skeet shooting and, you know, and, and contamination have kind of um, disrupted the process. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, what we're, um, what, what the recommendation today is something that, you know, as, as people have said, is really, uh, you know, the beginning of this process. I'm, I hear uh, some, you know, this sense of urgency and concern about um, making this move. And again, I know it's been stated, but I'll just reiterate um, what we're talking about here is opening up a process. So there, that we we do, you know, people say we haven't heard about this, and and that's true. And I, you know, me, I'm always <laughs> strongly advocating for community engagement, and I want to see that happen in this process. Um, in terms of environmental impact, um, you know, I've I've read through a lot of materials, and um, and as an aside, I'm I'm just going to ask because I was not able to access the original environmental impact report that some people have been referring to, and I'm just wondering if I, a question for staff if it's possible to get that to make that available on our website so that people who want to take a look at it can do that. Um, my read of the Pogo Note Master Plan, you know, correlates as well with what others have said. Um, but I think that go, that that at a minimum, beginning to explore this and um, for the the cost of getting a consultant on board and getting our staff, um, you know, uh, working with a consultant and having that expertise, we we will learn more. And we are not deciding today to move Pogo Note to the Upper Meadow. We are deciding on whether or not. We want to get that additional information to answer a lot of questions that, quite frankly, I don't. I don't feel that from what I've read, and I have read pretty extensively. I have answers to, and so we're we're kind of making assumptions about which area, you know, environmental sensitivity in you know these spaces. But there, I, I believe there are environmental impacts and potentially significant ones in either of the the locations. So, um, you know, I think for me, it just feels like. Moving forward with this process will help us understand. And again, that's what EIRs are for. Um, you know, to, to see, to look at, at the impacts, to really seriously study those, and to um, make determinations about alternatives. So a lot of the things that folks are saying that we need to have will have that process. At the same time, we're hearing, "Don't do it." So I guess I'm I'm leaning on the side of let let's do it. And I also have um, another. Um, in addition to uh, supporting, you know, and I, I'd like to make a motion if I could, and, and Bonnie Bush, um, our city clerk, has a copy of it. Um, I, I'd like to add a direction in there um, so that we have 
um, you know, we can actually get some additional information about the lower meadow and the constraints there, costs of remediation. We know it's good, you know, like the messages that I, so far in what I've read is like, it's gonna cost a lot of money <laughs> and, um, you know, there's, but there's some detail, you know, within that and there's some, uh, I think, navigating that um, that can be done. And so I, I wanted to just put this out there as a starting place for our conversation. Um, uh, to, so this motion is essentially uh, one and two is the staff recommendation to confirm the process and timeline for an amendment to the Pogo Net Master Plan. Um, it's, you know, it, this is a potential amendment. So I'll just say that. I don't need to say, know, know that it needs to be in the language, but for a potential amendment to the Pogo Net Master Plan to relocate the homeless garden project farm to the upper main meadow. Um, two, to adopt a resolution amending 22 budget. Um, and authorizing an additional appropriation to Parks and Rec for consulting services related to amendments and CEQA analysis. And then my addition is to direct staff to prepare an evaluation um, concurrently, uh, of the process for remediating contamination in the lower meadow, meadow to residential and therefore agricultural standards and that including an estimate of cost and timeline um, to circulate an update to the city council for consideration in the overall process as soon as possible. And I know that's additional work for our staff. So I've um, you know, submitted this in advance and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, folks are feel comfortable that this is a piece of the puzzle that, that ought to be done in order to get us the best information we can possibly get to make the best decision we can make um, that meets, you know, uh, meets the goals and um, uh, reduces any uh, environmental impact on the Pogo Nip. So there's the motion. Thank and you, Council Member. I'll Is there a, leave it there. Thank you so much. Is there a second to that motion? I see Vice Mayor Bruner, Council Member Cummings. I have my hand up. Uh, next, I'll second the motion and just <clears throat> express also appreciation of the community's comments. You know, the homeless garden project has been really patient with the city. You know, it's been over 20 years that they've been working with the city to try to bring this forward. Um, and the truth is that you know the city, the city initially identified the lower meadow, but you know when it was kind of at the last minute, the 11th hour, getting ready to break ground is when it became known. That the site was contaminated, you know, we had to shift. And so moving it to this area was never the intended location for this project. But as people have said, you know, we need to look for another place to put the homeless garden project. And, and this, what we're doing tonight is creating a process to evaluate the potential for it to go at this site at the upper meadow. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, and I, I do want to thank uh, the Parks and Rec Department for taking this out to the commission to get into commission support. I think it's gone to our Parks and Rec Commission multiple times now, and um, both times that, that the commission's weighed in, they've, um, maybe not unanimously, but um, they had, you know, majority support for at least taking this approach of, you know, starting a process and kind of, uh, and, and it's a process of evaluation to see what's the potential for this. And um, I really want to express my appreciation to the Parks and Rec Department um, commission for their support of this. And I think that, you know, given that we have that level uh, of community support and we've heard a lot of support from the community today, that at least starting this conversation is a good step so that people can have their voices heard and so that we can, you know, ultimately determine if this is the best outcome and option for us. And I think we owe it to the Homeless Garden Project, given their 20 years plus of patience uh, work to work with the city to find a permanent home that we owe it to them to, to go through this process. So I'm happy to second the motion before us. Thank you, Council Member. I have Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, thank you to uh, Director Elliott and Homeless Garden Project, Gary Ganshorn and Kathy Calfo for the information. Thank you to each attendee that sat on the phone and called in with your input and public comment and thank you to all the emails that we've received. Um, it's been very interesting. I think um, what's clear to me and um, is um, 
very apparent is that we need more data. And um, uh, as my colleague, Council Member Brown, was stating, this is the beginning of the process. And um, to determine really the argument of environmental impact and what exactly that will bring, um, as as uh, you know, it's stated that there are portions already developed, and um, in the area in the upper meadow, and the remaining portions that would need to be um, uh, farmed and garden. There are many emails and um, a lot of input, and I think even one caller that uh, really explained the process of organic farming and how it can create uh, increased biodiversity and create a home for the, the animals and the, the, the land and the, you know, everything in the area. So we need to know for sure if that would be the case and that's the data that would be sought in this process. So. Um, we, um, uh, I think that, you know, this is of that um, uh, exploration and I really appreciate the site comparison site. Um, I know a lot of, uh, or several of the arguments as well against this move was regarding the coastal prairie and I found it interesting that, uh, in the upper meadow, acres uh, would be used versus six acres in the lower meadow. Um, so less less impacts in various ways in that site comparison chart um, in the upper meadow. And um, uh, so I, I'm really curious to see as we go through this process. Um, so um, uh, like that, um, I know we spoke last meeting regarding some of the lower meadow remediation costs and timeline, and that was a question that was unknown. Um, I think that information will be valuable. So um, if there are any, um, I'm glad that's added into the, the motion, so thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other comments um, from other council members at this point? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, I'll just, oh. I'm, just, I'm sorry, Mayor, could I, if I could just make one more comment. Um, so another, I just will say that in conversations I've been having with people uh, outside of this meeting, their concern that was raised is related to what, you know, the, the remediation need that will exist in the lower meadow, regardless of the location of the ultimate location of the homeless garden project, and um, concerns about um, were we to make a decision that does not involve does not involve a requirement to remediate up to that residential level, higher standards that um, the city may decide to just cap it, and um, you know, which is is not you know, I mean, that has a lot of challenges in and of itself and, and problems associated with it. So, because, you know, lead moves, contaminants move, regardless of whether there's asphalt or concrete on the top of it. So, um, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that I heard those concerns too, and I think that that, it, I'm, I'm assuming it will, and I hope it will be uh, a part of the conversation and our ultimate decision-making about how we move forward, because that site is, is still, you know, up for uh, discussion about about what to do there. Thank you, member. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Boulder. Sorry, I didn't hear you call my name. Um, I guess I just had a couple of comments, and I think that one thing that everyone in the community can agree on is that nothing can be built in this community without tremendous um, public input and outreach and outcry. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's an organic farm, a ball field, or a library with affordable housing on top, um, somebody's gonna have something to say about it. And so I think I'm agreeing with my colleagues in that although it's expensive, it's important for us to move forward with uh, the 
public process and um, and um, I just want to say that the first speaker, Patricia, her comments really touched me and um, I think that if the I, this is you know irrelevant to this meeting. I would love to hear from the homeless garden how many people they have um, helped with job training and um, a path to being housed over the years. I think that's just you know something that the community would like to know. But um, anyway, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I have Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Collins Hart Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll keep my comments short. Also, I, you know, will express my appreciation as my colleagues have as well in terms of just the complexity of timeline and the balance of all of the different factors. And um, want to thank those who reached out to us and and gave us their input on this next step. I also want to thank the Homeless Garden uh, Project folks for being on and sharing um, really their thought process, which is very thorough and. Um, and, and rooted in a commitment to wanting to continue the great work that they are doing. And I too felt really um, moved by the speakers and just really want to recognize their incredible program. And so our job is to start this process now to figure out how to find a space for them that's going to work for um, our parks and our community at large as well as environmentally. And so I appreciate this direction. I also just wanted to add my appreciation for the, the additional um, component of the recommendation because I do think we want to also maintain an understanding of what's going to happen as well as the, you know a, a timeline associated with the lower metal meadow as well so um, those are my my brief um, yeah thank you very much thank you council member council member Colin Tari Johnson thank you I'll also keep my comments brief um, I also want to thank everyone who called in today um, and the presentation provided by our staff and Homeless Garden Project. Um, I've had the privilege of working with the Homeless Garden Project and some of the work I've done in the community around um, unhoused youth. Um, and so I've experienced firsthand how incredible their program is. Um, and I know that no none of the callers today um, questioned that. I heard that very loud and clear. Um, uh, I think, you know, my colleagues have all said it, but I think um, moving forward and exploring if this is a feasible um, uh, space for the Homeless Garden Project is a good direction. Um, I do hope that we can get creative about how we fund the consultants. I think um, let's put our heads together, let's partner with Homeless Garden Project and um, see if we can find some other outside resources. And I would be happy to um, work with our staff and with Homeless Garden Project to look at that. So, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah, and I'll just close with a few comments. So, um, you know, I, I it kind of in evaluating this, I really, you know, we have made a commitment to this organization and um, it may sound like a long time and it is a long time for 20, 20 actually 23 years. Um, nonprofits, are incredibly, um, they just do the work that, you know, government and business doesn't do. And their timeline is always longer. And it really, um, I think it just behooves the city to try to honor the commitment that we made to have them be on Poganip. Um, I appreciate the um, supporting the motion with regards to sort of doing in a sense, some parallel due diligence, you know, really understanding conditions in the lower meadow um, and really trying to get those details um, together so that we can, you know, really continue to make a, a decision here. Um, I also just want to acknowledge all the comments about Poganet, about its specialness to all the people of Santa Cruz. Um, and to, you know, really recognize that conservation um, actions are, you know, in a sense, they're really meant to be forever. And I think that's always a struggle for people when they perceive that there's been something to undo that foreverness of preservation and conservation of land. Um, I think though that, you know, doing this due diligence is really important. Um, I've, I've done a little bit of conservation, you know, land protection in my time. And um, it's always important to really understand, you know, that 
land, you know, change over time. Um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of that, unfortunately, in California in the last few years. Um, and I think really what we want to create is a community of stewardship around this property. Um, I visit it a lot weekly, um, used to be there almost every day. Um, and what we're really losing right now in Poganip is an actual commitment to stewarding that property. And it does need stewardship. It has a lot more invasive species on it than there used to be. Um, and, you know, we, we need to commit not to just looking at Poganip and appreciating that, although that is a, a great value to everyone, but um, we also have to provide some caretaking of the property. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth doing the due diligence with these two different um, sort of paths. And um, I will echo uh, the comments of colleagues that have mentioned, you know, if we can do, do some additional um, discussions with Homeless Garden to see, um, you know, how we might be able to uh, fund some of this would be very helpful. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, leave, to, to lose one of our projects, which is San Lorenzo Park uh, master planning, which I think is a really important part to the community. So, you know, if we can, if we can try to figure out how to do some of this work together, it would be, I think, very helpful. There's other park, um, park priorities that I think we don't wanna lose track of as the city as well. So those are my comments, but um, I am I will be voting for the motion. The director Elliott has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and appreciate um, really a lot of, of what you just said. I think one thing in particular, I just wanted to help um, provide some context on number three, and you mentioned uh, parallel due diligence, which I think is a great um, a great way to say it. I think on number three, and just to set the in for the council. Um, and the community, this the process that we're working through on the lower meadow um, is really in process already uh, related to this directive on number three. As I mentioned in the presentation, we'll get some feedback from our consultant that we expect on, on October 15th. County Environmental Health will then uh, review that and we'll kind of get into this planning um, phase for the, the remediation uh, plan and, and cost and so forth. We expect that, um, or we expect to have this information probably by the spring. Um, so for uh, Council Member Brown, I think who offered the, the motion here and for the council, um, and just on number three, just setting that expectation that as soon as possible is likely the spring when we have this inf um, in a more concrete way. Um, the other aspect I would just mention um, regarding the lower meadow is in part, how the lower meadow is remediated is based on how it is used. And so um, part of, the, uh, part of the, the process that we were undertaking with Homeless Garden Project uh, prior to Homeless Garden Project sending the letter to the council, uh, they were working on a site management plan uh, for the lower meadow to, to really define how it would be used and that's a real critical component for county environmental health um, to understand how that's going to be used and therefore what the level of remediation will need to be. Um, so we haven't spoken um, directly with Homeless Garden Project about this, but in that spirit of parallel due diligence, I think continuing that site management plan in the lower meadow may be a really critical step um, while we also go through this master plan amendment process um, because then what we could do is we could look at the lower meadow in terms of both um, uh, kind of a concept where, where farming is not occurring, but if farming is occurring in the lower meadow as uh, articulated by that site management plan, that would really help us uh, be able to compare and bring much uh, more detailed uh, information back to the council um, on number three. Uh, here in terms of the motion. So just wanted to, to offer a bit of that context uh, and recommendation for uh, that site management plan uh, in the Lower Meadow. Great, thank you, Director Elliott, for those clarifying comments. Um, okay, uh, we have a motion on the, on the floor um, by Council Member Brown and a second by Council Member Cummings. The motion is up for the public to see. And um, I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote, please. Mayor of Council Members Watkins. Aye. 
Helen Perry Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cumming. Aye. Holder. Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner. Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for participating tonight. We're gonna to move on to oral communications as final item tonight. Oral communication um, is a time uh, to um, speak to items not on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wanna comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions should be on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in, count, in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your, your name. Please remember this is the time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. And I was contacted by one individual, hopefully he's on the line tonight that I do know that is planning to speak. Um, and that's, I believe, Taylor. Uh, so uh, Taylor, you're the one hand up this evening. So um, if you press star six to unmute yourself. Um, I also see Gray Hayes has raised his hand, so I'll call him next. And this is for items not on the agenda. Okay, Taylor, go ahead, please. Hey there, everyone. Uh, my name's Taylor Lane. I've been a resident here in Santa Cruz for about 10 years. Thanks for granting some time for me to talk on this issue. Um, I am the creator of Surfboard, which is uh, several surfboards uh, made from over 100,000 cigarette butts collected off California beaches in just the last couple of years. Um, these are the most littered items in the world. There's 4.5 trillion, trillion of them littered every year. They're a non-biodegradable plastic, which breaks into microplastics accumulating in our marine organisms and eventually in our cells. Um, these uh, leach toxic chemicals such as arsenic, lead, nicotine into our environment, and they've been known as a fire hazard and have been responsible for over 88,000 acres burned in California since 1980. Um, Big Tobacco takes no responsibility for this. Um, they continually push this onto communities like us, uh, and it also is a health equity issue because oftentimes this disproportionately affects uh, communities and communities of color. So um, every year, Caltrans alone spends about $14 million picking up cigarette butts um, on the highways and dealing with this waste. Um, what we're looking to do is basically address this issue here in Santa Cruz. And, um, you know, the thing is, is no one is uh, out here advocating for it is a bipartisan issue. And city council has an opportunity to lead the world in holding big tobacco accountable for this waste. Um, so we're asking that uh, city council strongly support an ordinance to ban the sale of single use filtered cigarettes in any and all jurisdictions of Santa Cruz County. Um, you know, this, we can't wait five to 10 years. For, um, and we have an opportunity, we've traveled the world, we've seen this issue all over the place and we have an immense uh, opportunity at our fingertips to be the first uh, county to actually set a role model and example to hold these big corrupt corporations accountable for their waste. Thank you for the time. Thank you, thanks for joining us. Ray Hayes, Where? you're up next. This is for items not on the agenda. Go ahead, please. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, Gray Hayes, I'm an ecolo local ecologist, and I just wanted to say that recently looking at the um, parks master plan, I realized that uh, there's a priority in there to do wildlife and plant surveys, restoration plans, management plans for native species. I wanna suggest that that's super important. Uh, Santa Cruz City, you all are in charge of many endangered species. The water department's doing a at managing the aquatic systems. However, terrestrial systems in the Greenbelt 
have really seen very, very little attention. And it's a real shame because uh, we should set a good example with our environmental community. And I know we're being pulled in different directions. For instance, the Ohlone tiger beetle is a two city greenbelt lands. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, asked the city if they would, uh, if the Fish and Wildlife Service could pay for restoration of the Ohlone tiger beetle, right, translocation to the Poganip, and the city declined. We also, I worked on a, a grazing management plan for free with the Natural Resources Conservation Service for the city. They declined to accept it or even really implement it or think about it. I really want to ask, what is the city doing with its rare habitats except trying to create places where endangered species aren't anymore so that you can develop alternate uses? It's very sad. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other folks in the audience tonight who would like to speak regarding during uh, for items not on our agenda tonight? I'm not seeing any additional hands this evening. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn our meeting our meeting this evening. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, phone phone caller 1810, do you wanna to speak to oral communications? You can press star six if you wanna adjust us. Uh, yeah, uh, MNRA COVID vaccinations should be a personal informed choice, but suffer now an awful new power and greed tyranny. Newsom Biden government mandates inciting people to treat the others badly are exactly how the worst atrocities in history began. Over 6,500 uh, 6, have died because of vaccinations. Tens of thousands have had quite certain side effects. The death counts attributed to COVID are inflated. The average age of a COVID death is higher than the normal life expectancy, and the survival rate is 99.5% overall and is far higher for most people. mRNA vaccines do not prevent infection or transmission of COVID. Effectiveness is short-lived. Virus mutations for a simple virus like COVID are rapid. The existence of COVID-infected large animal populations is a virus reservoir. Eradication of COVID via these vaccines is therefore a pure fantasy or a lie. COVID can be a severe blood vascular disease for some, but the prohibitions on prescribing safe, cheap, timely antiviral treatments early on when they would prevent damage proven observationally all over the world and instead mandating problematic, expensive, patented big pharma drugs combined with protocol treatment possible of letting COVID ravage via quarantine, then prescribed malpractice death by ventilator was and is a mass murder. The now less credible, politicized, and unbelievably culpable CDC, Fauci, and Walensky, who still don't prioritize treatment research for the sick, await hell. I will also mention Governor Newsom wasted no time following the recall, signing a bill making permanent the fraud plague vote by mail system, signing AB9, dealing a death blow to single family housing, allowing up to two duplexes on an SFR lot, and signing AB1184, allowing children to get abortions and sex change operations without parental knowledge. Look, Ma, I got a double mastectomy. We'll be followed a few years later by, Mom, I thought this would make me happy, but now I feel like part of me is missing. I hope all those new some voters are enjoying more is more public education, leftist brainwashing of innocent children to hate white people, make people of color feel they are victims, promote leftist social justice worrying. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting this evening. Thanks everyone for attending. Good night.